2024. As always, Highland Radio make it easy for you as we look after all your needs. We will provide luxury transfers, overnight stay at the Clayton Hotel Belfast on a and b basis, your ticket to the show, shopping time in Belfast City Centre. For more information, go to the outlet at highlandradio.com or give us a call on 074 91 25000. Michael McIntyre in Belfast. There you have it. We're, as it. we're nice and early today for change. Oh, hey, uh, off. I'll, I'll tell you. Come here. How are you this morning? How are you? How's the van? The van passed the test. How did that feel? It felt magic for a 07 DL caddy van. It was just magic. We have gone to part, aren't you? are driving it. People think radio pays, right? I'm driving an 09. I'm just tight. I'm driving an 09 and you're driving an 07. No, but I bought it from you, 07, and I want to drive it until it's 20 years old at least. Yeah, well, you're not far off it. Aye, so I'm doing good. So and I'm any advisories? Yeah, the, probably going to need a couple of shocks. Oh, but sure, everyone needs well, a sure shock we're now grand and again. at that. Aye. I was happy. <laughs> Do you know, it's a, out with the piece of paper, had the cracks, and oh, is there much need to run? Oh, she's passed. And I says, yippee. But I was back to you about, you know, the waiting area. Mm. God, there's a big load of people in the waiting area. Mm, but it is, and everybody's silent. Do you know? And then It just think, reminds me of the old school GP surgery when you could actually get in. You'd love to go in, right? <laughs> I should, like, it was everything nice and quiet, right? And there's no TV or radio on or nothing, right? It was just all silent, everybody very quiet, looking at their phones, right? You'd love to go, yes, boys and girls, what's the crack of day? And you didn't. No, If I anyone didn't. was going to do it, it would be you. No, I did that. No, I didn't do it, no. So the van's good for another year. Um, Is it one year for a van? Or two. That's one year, right? Eh? Oh, good. That's well, good. Well, eh? Good news. I'm happy. Yeah, of course you are. Oh. And uh, today is National Hug a journalist day. Well, don't be looking at me. <laughs> well, it is. You can go out there and hug someone. Who? So who? Can I just run into McKenna? No, then? no. McKenna, can I come and give you, you a hug? Also, uh, McKenna, we had missed so many missed you opportunities. You also need informed consent. All oh, right. Oh, and oh, right. <laughs> I'm that joking. Sounds, no. And National Burrito Day, but National Hug and News Reader Day. Day as well. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So, Shannon You're full of information. This no, Shannon good. told me just before coming. Did she? She yeah. tells me nothing. Well, there you go. She you probably get didn't tea want you She made you the coffee a bit as well. Oh, no, did that myself. That's not too bad. All right, Lee, have a good Thursday. Will you? I will. Please, thank you. Okay, nine till noon show. It is just turned nine o'clock. Let's get a news update. And it's over to Michaela Clark. Thanks, Greg. Good morning. It's emerged sick people on Tory Island needing medical attention on the mainland are being transported to a waiting helicopter in work vans. Just two islands in Ireland have access to an ambulance on the island. They are Arnmore and Ornmore. In one recent case on Tory Island, an elderly woman was transported to the island's helipad in the back of a van surrounded by work tools. Councillor Michal Colmagill Asbuk says it is totally unacceptable for the HSC to put responsibility on islanders to provide a service they should be providing. He says islanders deserve equal care. People of the islands should have the same respect and dignity as the people of the mainland. Under no circumstances would we accept that's when somebody has an accident or somebody seriously ill and we call out an ambulance that we say, listen, go and get Mary a Paddy's work van. She will transport them to Little County on the back of a van. That's not acceptable. We wouldn't accept that. So why would the island community accept that? The Irish medical organisation is describing obesity as a new epidemic ahead of its AGM today. According to the HSC, 60% of adults and one in five children are overweight or obese. This amounts to one of the highest levels in Europe. IMO incoming president, Donegal Dr Dennis McCauley, says tackling the problem requires a considered approach. To have policies, not just medical, but sort of social uh, policies that can counteract that, there are people who have an natural inability to lose weight easily. We have to look at different ways that we can help these people put in place easy accessible services for them rather than limiting these services. Joe Biden is due to have a telephone conversation today with the Israeli Prime Minister. It's the first direct contact between the US President and Benjamin Netanyahu since the deaths of seven aid workers in Gaza. The UN suspended nighttime operations for at least 48 hours to value its security. Those killed in the Israeli airstrike were working for the World Central Kitchen, which provides hundreds of thousands of meals every day. 
And finally, following consultation with the FAI, Finn Harp's match against UCD this Friday will kick off at the earlier time of 5pm. The game has been brought forward because of a floodlight failure at Finn Park. The system failed the pre-match test on Wednesday evening because the wrong components were delivered to repair the system, which has been causing problems at home games this season. In a statement, the club said this regrettable situation is further evidence that the move to a new stadium is vital for the survival of the club. Weather now today will be mainly dry and mostly cloudy with a few bright intervals developing. Highest temperatures of 9 or 10 degrees. That's all from Highland Radio News for now. We'll be back with news again at 10 o'clock. Until then, good morning. Didn't know this car was diesel. It's not. At the garage you use the black pump. Diesel. No idea. So we're going to miss the flight, but sun holidays are overrated. All oh, that sun and sand, who needs it, eh? Or to use the black pump, diesel. No idea. So, I'll call Allianz Breakdown Assistance. With Allianz Car Insurance, you can also add breakdown assistance. Save 15% when you get a quote online at Allianz.ie. You write it, we underwrite it. Allianz. Allianz PLC is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Standard acceptance criteria, policy conditions and a minimum premium apply. Breakdown assistance is an optional extra and an additional premium applies. And now, it's time for the talk of the North West. The 9 to Noon Show with Greg Hughes on Highland Radio. Hello and a very good morning to you. It's five minutes past nine on this Thursday. Four minutes past nine uh, on my proper clock, sorry. Four minutes past nine on this Thursday, the 4th of April, 2024. And uh, welcome aboard, Brian on the uh, I was going to try with a boating analogy but you know what I'm not going to even bother trying uh, we are live with you now for the next uh, three hours on the 9 till noon show and there's lots coming up in the programme your voice your community coming up uh, after 10 between 10 and 11 I think and that and so much more besides and of course we want you involved in the conversation throughout the course of those three hours our WhatsApp and text lines are open right now 0866 25000 if you're outside the Republic it's 003538 5,000. You can send your voice notes to the WhatsApp on that number as well. Did you know that you don't actually have to hold down the microphone on WhatsApp? Uh, that you can um, just press it and then depress it and then tap it again when you finished your voice note. Uh, also, 07491 if you want to give us a call, Shannon and uh, Caroline taking your calls as always as well. And if you want to email, it's comments at highlandradio.com. If you want to watch the show, if it suits you, uh, then you can watch us on your big screen in the house, on your smart TV, we're on the YouTube app, and on your Fire Stick Highland Radio Ireland. We're on the X platform as well, at Highland Radio and across Facebook. Right, let's look at the papers. It's a busy Thursday uh, for newspapers, as it always is. The Tricconnell Tribune this morning, a public meeting in the Village Hall, Kilmacrennan, at the weekend, has called on the HSC to provide a modern new facility in the village. The meeting heard that a thousand people have signed a petition seeking action from the HSE to have the health centres in Churchill and Kilmacrennan fully restored. The meeting called on the HSE to build a brand new health centre to include ENT, physio and occupational therapy services. The health centre there has been closed since January 29th and according to comments at the public meeting it appears that very few uh, knew anything about much about this uh, latest loss of important local services. The front of the Donegal News this morning. Hundreds gathered in St. Eunan's Church Raffo yesterday for the funerals of Una Bowden and her daughters Kira 14 and Shorsha 11. Una and her two daughters were fatally injured when their car collided with a lorry on the N17 in Castle Bar outside Clare Morris, Cantimio last Tuesday. Originally from Raffo, Una and her family had been living in um, Moy Cullion, County Galway, as three wicker coffins draped in flowers, lined the altar. Father Eamon Kelly spoke of the terrible tragedy. Now etched in our minds forever, he said last Tuesday, was an ordinary, uneventful morning that hid the devastation that lay ahead. It is beyond comprehension, the loss. Um, three beautiful people um, taken from us. And um, we can only just offer a our thoughts and supports and prayers if it's appropriate to you to um, the father and, and partner and to all the family and the community uh, who are going to be terribly affected by that awful, awful tragedy. The Dairy News this morning, the organisers of a dissident Republican Easter commemoration 
in Derry have denied claims permission for the march was sought from the Parades Commission. The event organised by the Derry 1916 Commemoration Committee on Easter Monday started at the central drive area of Cregan before making its way to the city cemetery. A masked colour party led the parade, wreaths were laid at the Republican plot at the city cemetery and an oration was delivered. A police helicopter was in the skies throughout proceedings and a drone issued a warning to those assembled that it was an unnotified uh, parade. Apparently the media were attacked uh, um, around that event. Uh, petrol bombs thrown at media as organised deny permission sought for dissident Republican parade. On to the national newspapers now and uh, it's interesting to me anyway uh, that the conversation about Irish unity is starting to talk about the practical elements of it. I mean, it's all practical, but I'm on about the financial elements of it. Uh, and it's been kind of a line of questioning that I've tried to sort of push over the last wee while because, you know, maybe green and orange, uh, you know, unionist, uh, nationalist, those views, those feelings, that balance might actually... Uh, start a referendum uh, process or a unity process. But the reality is, is for many, many people across this island, and I think particularly further south you go, it is what is the impact on the economy? What is the impact on taxation? What is the impact on infrastructure? What's the impact on uh, growth and Ireland's position uh, financially and what have you? Uh, and a new report sort of has started to uh, cast light on that. And I think it's a really important conversation and what will actually decide whether or not this island is united once again. Uh, but some of the findings, taxings, uh, taxes <clears throat> would have to increase dramatically and public expenditure uh, south of the border be cut to pay costs of Irish unification that could run to £20 billion a year for 20 years, according to a study published today. The report published by the Institute of International and European Affairs is authored by the Economic and Social Research Institute Dr John Fitzgerald of Trinity College Dublin, I think he's a son of Gareth Fitzgerald, and Dublin City University academic Professor Edgar uh, Morganroth. Excluding the impact of COVID on public spending everywhere, the two academics put the cost of the UK Treasury's contribution to the running of Northern Ireland at £10.5 billion annually. That's pounds, uh, the figures given in 2019. Basic unification costs after losing the London subvention and adjusting for other factors would run to nearly 11 billion euro a year. However, the cost would jump to 20.5 billion if social welfare, pensions and public service pay rates to people in Northern Ireland were brought into line with those currently in force in the Republic. You'd expect that too. You can't expect the British to keep putting their hands in their pockets because they would say, look at the Irish economy, it's doing well, why should we continue to pay? Uh, public spending would rise by one quarter, they note, while the higher borrowing costs uh, that would last for years afterwards would prompt a dramatic increase in taxes and or major reduction in expenditure south of the border. Nothing uh, noting that it took 30 years before pension and public sector wages in the unified uh, Germany were made equal, while private sector wages were still not equal, the academics said it would be difficult to postpone such a standardisation of rates across the United Ireland for long. Such action would add €10 billion a year to state spending. So when we do get down to the nitty-gritties of a uh, unity or, or otherwise campaign, these are uh, the kind of costs and topics and what have you that are likely to be discussed, I would say. Uh, the Irish Independent, Simon Harris, tied up the vital votes of three independent TDs last night as his bid to become Taoiseach uh, next Tuesday. Roscommon Galway Deputy Dennis Nocton confirmed he had thrown his weight behind the new Fine Gael leader and it is understood Tipperary Independent Michael Lowry and former Fianna Fáil TD Mark McSharry will also back Mr Harris. But at what cost? We don't know. That's a secret. Mr Nocton is very much uh, from the Fine Gael gene pool, but his support nonetheless... August well for Mr Harris. The former Fine Gael TD said last night after a meeting between the pair, I know Simon Harris for well over 20 years. I've worked with him in the past and so on and so forth. Mr Larry confirmed to RTE that he planned to support Mr Harris after he described as robust and positive discussions and said Mr Harris agreed to liaise with him about projects for his constituency. But again, what are the projects? What are the costs? Uh, 
he also has the support, of course, of uh, Joe McHugh, who is outside the Fine Gael party, but also of that uh, Gene Poole. So that's your independence for you. Uh, they have meetings. He's got two further meetings today, and I'm sure, sure he'll secure uh, their support as well. He doesn't actually need it to become Taoiseach, but going forward, uh, he needs them on side for votes of confidence or if the government wish to pass things in case there's any abstention within his own ranks. The Irish Daily Mail this morning, teachers have rallied or railed, I beg your pardon, against the Catholic Church control of primary schools and what the religious certificate required to teach abolished. What do you think about this? In a multi-pronged move aimed at the Catholic patronage of schools, some teachers at a union congress in Derry also said they no longer wanted to instruct children in the Catholic faith, also known as faith formation. With a shortage of teachers nationwide, the Irish National Teachers Organisation branded the religious qualification required for teachers as discriminatory, uh, particularly at a time when a declining, and I'll go to page four, when a declining number of the population identifies Catholic. A notion to remove this requirement was passed by a large majority at the INTO conference, and teachers now want to examine whether faith formation classes should take place in primary schools at all. So uh, the majority of the INTO seem to be in favour of a religious certificate not being required to teach, but also that they are not responsible for faith formation or teaching the Catholic faith in national schools potentially uh, big ramifications there. What do you think about that? 0866 60 25,000. The Irish Farmers Journal this morning. The provision of measures to alleviate fodder shortages on farms have not been ruled out by Minister of State at the Department of Agriculture, Martin Hayden. He said the Irish, or he told the Irish Farmers Journal that possible measures being considered included short term cash flow financing and logistical support for fodder deliveries to severely impacted areas if uh, the current conditions. Uh, persist. Not great farming weather and more rain on the way and uh, some wind too at the weekend though uh, whilst we won't escape it, the south of the country is going to uh, bear the brunt. The Mirror this morning, more than 5,000 people have entered emergency accommodation since the ban on no-fault evictions was lifted last year, Owen O'Brien claimed yesterday. The Sinn Féin TD said the vast majority were as a direct result of last April's decision. The government introduced a ban on no-fault evictions last winter amid inflationary pressures and rising homelessness, but new figures released last week revealed the country has reached a new record of people in emergency accommodation, 13,000 841 by the end of February. This includes 4,170 children, also the highest recorded across uh, 1,994 families. So just to, just to recap that, because sometimes we read this stuff and I'm not sure it lands, if you know what I mean. We hear it, but it doesn't land. But currently in this country, um, we have 4,170 children living in emergency accommodation. Now, I have not been in emergency accommodation. I don't know what it's like. Uh, maybe some of you out there have an insight, but it's certainly not permanent, and I'm sure uh, it's not ideal uh, by any stretch of, of the imagination, but over 4,000 children in emergency accommodation. The Daily Star this morning, the Attorney General for Northern Ireland has warned the public and media about the consequences of sharing commentary on social media discussing the court case facing Geoffrey Donaldson. News broke last week that a 61-year-old man from County Down had been charged with rape and other historical sexual offences. Uh, I was off for that bombshell of a story that uh, landed on Friday. In fact, the show was off air on Friday. Really quite remarkable. Um, last Friday, Donaldson resigned as leader of the DUP after he confirmed that he had been charged with allegations of historical nature. The PSNI have previously warned against social media commentary on the case, and now Brenda King, the Attorney General for Northern Ireland, has issued a similar statement. And the reason for that is, and some might think it's to, you know, bury something or to keep it quiet or this, that and done, is, is that... Um, public commentary on things like that there especially on platform uh, on, on on online platforms and especially if it gets traction can damage a case and also uh, uh, any potential alleged victims too can uh, hinder potentially them getting justice broadly speaking not speaking to that case specifically so that's why they've issued uh, those warnings there and uh, lastly in the sun i wonder why um 
concerned Cheltenham bosses are, are holding a steward's inquiry as to why Irish punters gave the races a miss. Thousands didn't cross the Irish Sea last month in protest at the rip-off prices. Now, the English Jockey Club has emailed the thousands of Irish racegoers that have uh, on their record, asking them to complete a survey uh, covering every aspect of the four-day uh, NAG festival. Punters were asked their opinions on ticket prices, the cost of hotels and the racetrack experience. They were also quizzed in the, on the high cost of food and drink, which saw bars charge 8 to 11.50 a pint. Can you imagine? Not surprising, one in five Irish fans that would normally travel didn't uh, travel. OK, that was a run through the papers. We'll be uh, joined by our first guest on the show after these. Daily newspapers are courtesy of Kelly Centra and Diner Mountaintop Letter Kenny, winner of Best Family Dining at the Highland Radio Hospitality Awards. Did you know Tinny's Toys stock top toy brands like the Care Bears, VTech, Leapfrog, Lamaze, Playmobil, Tonka and much more. We also have a massive range of outdoor toys like swings, slides, swing ball, goal posts and rebounders. And don't forget, we're still Ireland's largest farm toy superstore. Open Monday to Saturday, Leck Road, Letterkenny or online at tinnystoys.com. New this week in Home Store and more. All mattress protectors are all half price. But better hurry, because when all our half price mattress protectors are gone, they're gone. Also, all outdoor heating and all ironing boards are still all half price. But when all the half price outdoor heating and all the half price ironing boards are gone, they're definitely gone. Drop by your local Home Store and more. Or visit us online at homestoreandmore.ie. New store now open in Frascati Centre, Black Rock. Home Store and more. A happy home. Donegal County Council have published the proposed material alterations to the draft County Donegal Development Plan 2024-2030, including area plans for Boncrana, Ballybuffet Stranorler and Bondoran. The four-week public consultation period runs from Friday 8th of March 2024 until Friday 5th of April inclusive. For full details and to have your say, visit donegaldevplan.ie. For day-to-day -day healthcare needs, generations have trusted the experienced staff at McGee's Chemist Letterkenny. From coughs and colds to aches and pains, from vitamin supplements to first aid essentials. McGee's have what you need, when you need it, with a full prescription service available daily. McGee's Chemist Main Street Letterkenny. For healthcare help and advice you can always trust. Ryan Adams is back on tour in 2024. Join Highland Radio on our trip to Dublin to see the man himself at the Three Arena on Tuesday the 21st of May 2024. Your trip includes luxury transfers, bed and breakfast at the four-star Carton Hotel Blanchestar, your standing ticket to the show and a shopping trip to Dublin City Centre the following day. Find out more on the outlet at highlandradio.com or call us on 074 9125 now, on the programme uh, yesterday, we discussed extensively the future of uh, the site um, on which the Crease explosion uh, happened. Ten people lost their lives. We understand a planning application uh, is in the process of or has just been submitted to uh, redevelop uh, the site. Now, those behind that redevelopment, um, hopefully... Um, they may speak to me or um, at least issue a statement. We understand uh, that is in the works. And as much as is possible, we're trying to deal with this incredibly sensitively uh, because there are those who are strongly opposed to it and they deserve a voice as well. But also, I'm acutely conscious, and I've tried to make this point all along, that I'm from outside uh, Creasler. I don't want to be seen to be interfering. I know there might be different views as to what should happen, uh, and they've been expressed on this programme what should happen going forward and it's a tough one because some people obviously want this area to be preserved as a, a memorial um, but others also uh, recognise that what was there before was incredibly important uh, at the heart of, of Chris and what have you. So um, it is, as I say, an incredibly uh, sensitive uh, subject but we can't shy away from that either. We can just try and be as... Uh, sensitive and as balanced as is uh, possible. Uh, Ronan Hegarty uh, contacted us also to um, have a word on this. Ronan, thank you for your time. 
And thank you for having me, Greg. Right, now, um, you are a friend of Leona Harper. You've known, uh, you knew Leona for a long time. I have indeed, yeah. Um, so I feel like it should be a nice memorial for uh, the 10 victims who sadly passed in that tragic accident. Um, I feel like where the site is, it should be a dislocated area. I feel like it should turn into a nice memorial mm-hmm. for respect for the 10 victims who sadly passed. And I feel like it wouldn't be healthy for the community also, no one that what happened in that shop. I feel like it should be a nice memorial and they can move the shop somewhere else. Do you think there's any possibility that the site could house a memorial and perhaps a, a shop? I do, but I also feel like that will still be bad for some of the community of Chrysler and the families who, like I said, did pass away in that tragedy. And I feel like it shouldn't be, um, in my own opinion, I feel like it should turn into a nice memorial or a garden to walk through to pay respect or tribute to the people who did pass away in that accident. Mm. Uh, talk to me a little bit, we'll, we'll return to that, but just to remember Leona as well, uh, as someone that you've known, uh, how do you remember uh, Leona, Ronan? I would remember Leona since I was a uh, wee kid. Me and, me and her used to run around together when we were children. Um, we used to just go outside and play together, probably then do homework together and all that stuff. I knew her since I was about five, six years old. So would have been a, very difficult for you too when you learned of her very tragic passing as well, I'd imagine, especially as a young person, Ronan. Yeah, no, it was hard to hear whenever my friend saw the past in the accident. I wasn't happy. Like, I was sad enough. Yeah. And I do miss her, and that's why I'm thinking it should be a nice place for our memorial. Okay. Well, listen, uh, that, that's, um, that's your uh, view, and uh, we hear you, Ronan. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you so much, Greg. Okay, that's Ronan Hegarty. Um, he is a friend of Leona Harper, a childhood friend, and also... Um, is of the view that uh, a memorial should be built to the 10 victims on that site. Right, OK, let's uh, go now to Aidan Campbell, commercial officer at Finn Harps Football Club. Good morning, Aidan. Good morning, Greg. Uh, on the pitch, things go well so far this season, aren't they? Don't, let's not count our chickens, it's early on, but uh, it, it's, it, it's good to see the success, it's good to see the team coming together. Yeah, we uh, um, we had a year of rebuilding last year, Greg, in which we uh, brought a lot of young players in and um, we knew that it would be a, a challenging season. But we've added a bit of experience to them this year with the likes of David Colley and Connor Tourish. And, um, we, we signed an exciting player in Success Edigan, which who's captured the imagination of, uh, I think, particularly younger supporters. So um, a couple of other signings as well, Greg, and they've been a very good start, great bunch of lads. And um, Murph and Kevin have instilled a real healthy kind of uh, culture and ethos uh, around the first team squad. So we're very pleased with the start we've made. Yeah, and it, it, and it creates a buzz, doesn't it? And success breeds success. You just hope now everyone, the team can build on it going forward. Uh, that's on the pitch. Uh, I suppose also on the pitch to some extent uh, when they're working are the floodlights. Um, and it's they're old, aren't they? And, and, and plans have been afoot for quite some time to, to have them upgraded, uh, Aidan. But just things haven't gone the way of Harps. Uh, they haven't, um, Greg. I suppose the story behind the floodlights is, I, I, I don't know if your listeners remember, but when Sky Television started broadcasting the, 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 the premiership into the country, it was part of the agreement that they would fund floodlights. So that's how long ago it was, you know, it really was back in the day. So they've required a lot of maintenance over the years. And obviously a lot of clubs are switching over to the LED system. So they have a number of components that um, are very hard and increasingly difficult to source. So, um, you know, it could be the ballast, the igniters, the wiring at the back or the bulbs. Um, and um, even when you get those things, sometimes they're very stubborn. So we tested them um, because I know people were asking online about this. Of course, we test them always at the start of the season for licensing. And we've passed a, what they call a lux test. And they were okay. Now, the, a, a big problem has been the amount of rain in the last year as well. So it, there, there's a number of different factors which can go wrong. Um, 
we had applied um, for grants that we're finding it difficult to access because obviously we're um, working on the different avenues for the new stadium as well. So uh, that's a bit complicated. But um, we had a number of components arrive yesterday. Um, now, the, the, the situation has been ongoing this year, and some of them, even with the right components, haven't been coming on. But uh, unfortunately, some a few components didn't arrive yesterday. We tested them again, and another few lights were out. So we were in consultation with the FEI, and everybody feels terrible. And apologies for any convenience to our supporters who've been really turning up in numbers, even through the bad times last year. So uh, everybody feels terrible about us, uh, Greg, but we have to keep perspective. Um, it's a football match, so yeah. we just have to get on with exactly, it, you know, exactly. and uh, we'll go with an early kickoff. Do you know what? Do you know what? The early kickoff might suit some as well. Uh, w- w- but long term, right? Obviously, the plan is to get into a new stadium, and this uh, new stadium, and this really obviously strengthens the the argument for the need for that. If any further uh, strengthening of the argument was needed, but what what to the future going forward now? Because I mean, I mean, you have to make a decision about spending good money after bad too, I suppose. Um, I think you've hit the nail on the head there, Greg. I mean, it's, it, they're not just the lights. Anybody who knows the ground, um, you know, we, we're adding bits to it as we go on. And it's kind of like if people can imagine with the, the electrics and the plumbing and everything else, it's kind of like a car that's had a bits added to it through the years. And this thing has been linked to this thing. And, you know, it's um, we've had fantastic work from the, the supporters and local trades people, as we've said. Um, and they take a lot of they, they take pride in the place you know this um it, it needs constant work and you could throw a lot of money at it and it would still struggle in some areas it's funny you know our, our, our new club secretary uh, rory white he I, I came in one day and he was building a kind of cubicles for the players and the um um in the dressing room um and that, that's the club secretary and he had them all painted and stuff look fantastic but um it's it's really it's it's past its sell by date, Greg. You know we've been very open about that, and um, it's it's just not a modern um, stadium. So we could spend money. We don't have a lot of it to spend on it. So um, we need to really look to the future now. And um, there's a lot of you know we are uh, you know we go back to the, to the beauty of being a fan owned club and a servant as well. But we'll have an EGM soon to discuss you know other options about how we finance it going forward because they're expensive things to run um but i suppose all that discussions for another day you know in the meantime again apologies to anybody who yeah but do you think convenience by decision do you think these pro- issues with the lights can be resolved you know before the next home game after that or i mean thank god it's it, it it's uh the, the the season's running into the later evenings i suppose but i mean can, do you anticipate these lights being on this season yeah, I would look. I hope so. I can't give a guarantee, um, uh, Greg, because I'm not. I, I, you know what I mean? I'm not qualified to do it, and they are unpredictable. But I would be hopeful that if we can get, um, we we um, we're away for three weeks after this this match. We've we played six of, of our first space, right? nine games yeah. at home, so we've got a bit of breathing space to have a, have a look at it. And obviously, the FAA will will want guarantees as well about. Um, you know, you know that uh, they, they will work going forward. So uh, I'd be hopeful that we would, um, Greg. But I'm not going to say it 100 percent until we've got the work. In. I think it's kind of fingers crossed that the right parts uh, arrive and the right yeah. person's there to stick them in. Um, it's kind of I know exactly. You know, you know what I mean? It's a it's a it's a it's a, it's, a, it's a big club, right? It's a big issue, but it's kind of the same as someone trying to figure it an issue out at home as well too it's it's kind of small in its way as well all right well sure keep us up to date i'm sure the sports team will and continued success on on, on the pitch and hopefully uh, the good form of the season carries uh, over the next period of away games and what have you all right, Aidan, that line has just dropped, really, which is at a good time because the interview was concluded. So, obviously, the club apologetic that the game has to be brought forward at the weekend to 5 p.m., but, I don't know, it might suit some people. Nice to watch a game in daylight as well. Watch the show live now on YouTube, Facebook and at highlandradio.com. Have you entered our €10,000 home makeover draw? If the answer is yes... 
you are now automatically entered into our extra cash giveaway. If the answer is no, then now is the time to enter. Grey Cues will be ringing one lucky person on Friday the 5th of April, giving you the chance to win €2,500 in cash. That's not all. You will still have a chance of winning in our main draw of a €10,000 home makeover in association with Foy & Company, plus €5,000 in cash. Get your ticket now at HighlandRadio.com. If you've lost someone close, it could help to talk. Why not call the Bereavement Support Line on 1-800-807077, Monday to Friday, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. We're here to listen. Managed by Irish Hospice Foundation and supported by the HSE. Mixed messages on fodder supports. For more in your Farmer's Journal, here's Paul Mooney. Department and Minister at odds over how to help farmers as spring deteriorates. We have key advice for farmers on on on-off grazing, managing delayed turnout and what to do about silage fertiliser. Demand continues to exceed supply in lamb trade. Farmer fury over government support for BBD programme. We talk to the suckler farmer breeding €4 Euros per kilo weanlings. Plus, we look at how the vacant home renovation grant is paid. All inside this week's Irish Farmers Journal. Safe Tech are running appointed persons training in Donegal and Dublin in April. Also running crane lifting supervisor, quad bikes, electrofusion and butt fusion welding programs. All programs are part funded. Terms and conditions apply. And certification accepted on Irish and UK construction sites. If you have a group, Safe Tech trainers will go to you. Contact safetech.ie today for more information. Aurora's Hobbits, Crossroads, Kelly Gordons seek employees to join their expanding crash. Both full-time and part-time roles from 15 to 40 hours per week depending on the role must hold a QQI level 5 or equivalent. Please apply by email to aurorashobbits at gmail.com. Our McCullough Jewellers in Letterkenny are synonymous with fine jewellery, quality watches and giftware. With stores at Main Street Letterkenny and the Letterkenny Shopping Centre or online at ourmccullough.com. You can choose from their quality product range in a relaxed atmosphere. And their sales staff will be happy to help you make the right choice, whatever the occasion. Our McCullough Jewellers, making moments magical for generations. Okay, so we heard uh, and read figures this week uh, that pointed to the fact that sales of new battery electric cars, BEVs, fell by 41% last month amid fresh calls for the government to intervene to make them more affordable. Uh, This is now a serious concern about how the transition to electric has stalled over the first quarter of 2024, traditionally the busiest buying period of the year. Uh, But what is the experience of owning an electric car like? Mary, good morning to you. Are you there? Yes, Greg, I'm here. Good morning, how are you? I am doing fantastic. Right, you have an electric car or had an electric car? Yes, yes I do. And I am very happy with my electric car, per se. Mm -hmm. But it's the technology that runs behind these cars that are the problem, in my opinion. Okay, so let's talk about the positives. Why did you decide to go electric, Mary? Why did I decide to go electric? Well, I wanted to do my bit for the environment. I don't do a lot of driving. I'm an old age pensioner. I don't do a lot of driving. And I figured that it would be very convenient. My children all recommended that electric car was the way to go. And you got the charger installed at home uh, for what you required just before we get to the, you know, the difficulties yes. all as well. Yes, I did. I Yes, I did. I'll tell you, I bought, ordered my car in November, but because there was an issue with the uh, COVID and delivery and getting things at transfer, I didn't actually get my car to April, mm-hmm. but I got my charger installed in January. So I was waiting then until my car came. Now, when my car came, um, there was issues with the charging. It would charge, but it would keep cutting out. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I mean, not being computer au fait, I hadn't a clue what was going on. So I was on to the company, on and backwards and forwards and phone calls and phone calls and getting nowhere. In the end, I ca- after four months of this, I got in touch with the co- the manufacturer and they came back to me and they said, your, your car and your charger aren't connected. So I rang back to the supplier in Cork of the uh, charger and one phone call, they talked me through connecting my phone to the charger and I've had no problem since. Okay, so you think the ball was dropped in this process in the 
uh, in the after sales service than with the dealer. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, I also now. Do you want to hear my next story? <laughs> Carry on, Mary. Okay, right. Drove my car, loved it, no problem charging, no problem, it's fine. So then about um, two months ago, I was driving and this thing came up on the screen uh, telling me that my car was in need of a charge in X amount of weeks or when I reached a certain mileage. A service, I think now, you might have meant to I say was, there. Was it a service, Mary? Or a, a charge? service, yeah. Okay, a service, well, okay. You see, a service, a, an electric car doesn't get serviced for two years. Yes, okay. And I've only had mine since, I haven't had it a year yet. All right. So I rang up the, my, uh, the, the guy that I bought the car off, and he said, oh, no, he says, disregard that. He said, someday when you're in Letter County, he says, just come in and we'll sort that out for you. I said, okay. So then the next thing that came up, was my that my tires needed reinitialization? Mm -hmm. So I rang I rang them up again, and he said, "Yeah, no." He said, "Don't worry about that. Disregard." He says, "Bring it over on Tuesday, and we'll sort all that out for you." I said, "Excellent." So took the car over on Tuesday, and he said, "Can you leave it here with me?" And I said, "No problem." I went away. I had lunch. They called me, and they said, "Your car sorted. Come and pick it up." So. And that picked it up. Before I got to Bala Buffet, all the lights were, all those things that I stated were back up on the car again. Mm -hmm. So, and you can't ignore on the them. Way they're, home, they're, annoying on, they're annoying on the screen, aren't they? Uh, those notifications. Yeah, because I don't know if I can drive with it or whether I can't. You know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a mechanic, and I don't. Well, not, not the, you need a mechanic now for you need an electrician, not an right? Electrician. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, well, anyway, you were saying, so on the way yeah. back, go ahead. Sorry, now on the way back, I thought, do you know this reinitialization of the tires? I thought I'll just call into the tire centre. So I called into the tire centre and I said, can you tell me? Because it's all in different terminology now. Um, I said, can you tell me how many how many how many pounds if I need to put into my tires? And he said to me, put it up on the street there. He says, the uncle, I'll do it for you. Mm -hmm. He said, it's about £30, pounds. and I said, great. So got it up, and the young fella filled it in, put, filled in the tyres. And when he was finished, I said, you don't know nothing about electric cars, do you? And he said, well, what's your problem? And I said, well, you can see there that it says my tyres need reinitialization." Re and he said, oh, yeah, all right. He says, get out. He said, so he got in, he pressed two buttons, and sorted the problem. Yeah. That's not something exclusive to electric cars. I didn't want to sort of intervene on that, but uh, sometimes you have to tell the computer, and it's not just electric cars, I've got 30 in each tyre, and that's the sort of the benchmark, if you know what I mean, and then it can gauge whether they increase uh -huh. or, or decrease. So that's not exclusive to electric cars, but still this could have been fixed at the garage is what you're saying effectively, rather than you having to... Exactly. Yeah, okay. And now since since... Since that, um, not on the screen, but on the, the outer part of the screen, I have a little yellow spanner came up, which also tells me that my car is in need of a charge. It's service. You know, and it's, uh, sorry, it need of a, excuse me. You're obsessed it's with charging, Mary. You're obsessed with charging. <laughs> I'm obsessed with charging because I've had, oh my God. Yeah, I went through so much at the start. Uh, you know, yep. to me, you see, I'm a, I'm an old age pensioner. This car caused me. It was it was, a, it was an adjustment for me to get used to it, and I did find it quite traumatic. You know, because I don't know all these wattage and kilowatts and all this it means nothing to me. You know. Yeah. And so, I was putting my trust in them, but I'm very disappointed now that they didn't. I believe that when my car went to the garage, it should have been put on, um, should have been connected to the computer. Yeah, but Mary, I want to say one thing, and I'm not sure if you disagree or not disagree. This doesn't sound to me like it's electric car related. This sounds to me like just a little bit of basic understanding, maybe realising that, you know, that you might need a little bit more assistance with the app to get that sorted, uh, clearing uh, clearing the service reminder uh, and just re it, re, uh, recalibrating uh, the tyre pressures or reinitiating the system. Like, 
it's not an electric. This could have happened to a, 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 a petrol or diesel car. This sounds just to me like a little bit of poor after service or a lot of poor after service, Mary, that's kind of absolutely, ruining your ruining your otherwise positive I, experience. Absolutely. But I am dealing with an electric car, so I assume it's an electric problem. I get you. I understand, yeah. And I'll, t- I'll just tell you another thing. When I got the car, they never asked me if I had a computer. Or if I had a laptop, mm-hmm. right? So I anyway, bought the car. After I had the car for about a month, this thing came up on that my software had to be downloaded. Mm. I get you. For, you know, for my GPS and all that kind of thing. I didn't have... I. It had to be put onto a memory... This information had to be put onto a memory stick, mm-hmm. installed to the car. Mm-hmm. I didn't have a computer or... Whatever. You, Mary, you need me in your I life. I, 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 you need me in your life, Mary. I could have done all of this for you. Yeah, yeah, I, you probably could, yeah. But anyway, I, that was another thing. I, I went back to them, and they knew nothing about it. When I when I told him what, what I had found out, mm. he said, well, what are you talking about? And I, I showed it to him, and he said, oh, well, he said, I'll take that off your phone, off my phone, right? And he said, we'll put it on, our, on a stick, and you can come back, and we'll put it in for you. Now, do you go to Letterkenny? It's not just down the road, right? Mm-hmm. So anyway, I said, okay. So he took my phone, he downloaded what he needed, and I'm waiting on him since to get back to me. Yeah. I, um, I really... What ca- I, sorry, yeah. let me just finish this. Go ahead. When I, what I had to do then, what I had to do then was email the information to my son who lives in Austria. He therefore then downloaded it onto a memory stick. He posted the memory stick back to me. And then he talked me through installing it into the car. Oh, wow. Right. Okay. And that worked? Oh, so it's sorted, yeah. yeah. And now I've got another email that I've got to go through the whole thing again. Well, listen, we're not mentioning but any... I don't bit. use the software because... Of course, but, like, you see, this is... this The customer services is so important, and it's really regrettable that the ball's been dropped here. Like, I mean... You would... If you change your car, it's likely you would go somewhere else, isn't it? If you could, do you know what I mean? Would you go, yeah, if, you, I was, like if, if, you're, if you're changing your car now, again, yes, do you know what I mean? So, this, yes. for, for yes. five minute issues that could have resolved this while you were waiting, if the truth be told, Mary, because I know I, I, everything you've explained, I know what you're talking about, okay? Five minutes could have sorted this. And because that didn't happen, and because you had to go through all this rigmarole, you might actually shop somewhere else again, and the cars are really considered purchase. It's very regrettable. Okay, Mary. Well, listen. Uh, so, would you go electric again? Of course, I love the car. Brilliant. Okay, but it's just I, the now service. when it's due for a service, when now when it's due for a service, I won't be going to that particular garage. Yes. I will go to another garage that sells the same cars because I don't they don't know about electric cars where I went to okay I'm that's sorry. my opinion I get you Mary listen uh, it's been insightful uh, and maybe you know people listening might go if they're in in these businesses just the simple acts after the sale can uh, keep a customer for a long long time thank you Mary happy motoring take care of yourself <laughs> okay, well, Bye. I hope I was clear enough in my putting my story across. Okay, Crystal thanks, clear. Greg. Okay, Bye. okay, so um, it, it's quite a remarkable story, particularly, I think, the fact that, uh, particularly, I think, the fact that she um, had to engage the services of her, had to engage the services of her son in Austria to download it onto a stick, send the stick to her in Donegal and upload the maps and what have you that way. Okay, uh, we're going to take a very quick break. We're going to be back with Deputy Marion Harkin after these. Don't miss the BAFTA award-winning comedian Michael McIntyre's brand new show, Magnificent, at the SSC Arena Belfast on Friday the 31st of May 2024. As always, Highland Radio make it easy for you as we look after all your needs. We will provide luxury transfers, overnight stay at the Clayton Hotel Belfast on a B&B basis, your ticket to the show, shopping time in Belfast City Centre. For more information, go to the outlet at highlandradio.com or give us a call on 074 91 25000. Michael McIntyre in Belfast. 
Join Homeland Nether Kenny's Garden Super Saturday this Saturday, 6th of April. Meet the expert Homeland Garden Centre team and enjoy exclusive offers in store, including Homeland Lawn, Feed and Weed. Buy two bags, get two and a half litre Homeland Lawn Hero free. Mobactor, Moss Remover, 20 kg, buy two for 65 euro. FCO, 18 inch lawnmower, now 449 euro, save 100. All this and more, see homeland.ie. Visit Inishon Co-op Home Build Show at Inishon Gateway Hotel, Bonkrana on Saturday, April 13th, 11 to 5 p.m. Meet the suppliers for expert advice and all your home build needs. MICA supports available on the day. See Facebook for details. Experience total relaxation in the spa at Orchids at the Holyrood Hotel Bondoran. Recently awarded Best Hotel Spa Getaway at the RSVP Spa Awards. Enjoy luxury spa baths, revitalizing facials, rejuvenating massages, pampering body treatments, outdoor hot tub and tranquil Japanese garden. Visit on a luxury spa day, pop in for some me time or buy the perfect present with a gift voucher. Relax and let the spa at Orchids transport you to another world. See HolyroodHotel.com it's time to visit Ireland's newest Lexus dealership, Lexus Letter Kenny. With 50 years of experience, you can trust us in this new era of electrification. Experience our all electrified range, including the stunning ES Hybrid Saloon and our award winning range of plug in hybrid SUVs. And view our finance offers, including the all new LBX. Start your 241 journey with Lexus Letter Kenny Port Road. Lexus. Experience amazing. Highland Radio Weather Updates brought to you by McElhenney's. With over 50 years of serving the community in Donegal, McElhenney's is proud to be part of every moment, big and small. Support local, shop McElhenney's Bally Buffet. OK, you're welcome back to the programme. We are joined on it now by Deputy Marion Harkin. Good morning to you. Thank you so much for your time today. Greg, thank you. Uh, right, OK, so... Um, Petrol and diesel prices have gone up again. And, and sort of, I think, often the national conversation ignores, uh, you know, the particular circumstances we have uh, along the border. You're talking of a, a two-tier fuel economy. Can you give us a bit more detail on that? Yeah, well, anybody who lives along the border knows what I'm talking about. Uh, it's simply about the difference or the differential in price uh, between fuels uh, on the south of the border and the north. And I raised this last September, indeed before that, but I could see what was coming down the tracks. Um, with, I raised it with the minister. And one of the points I made to him was uh, that the minister for finance lives in Cork. So like, he's not really you know, personally affected by, and his constituents aren't personally affected by the difference or the potential difference in price of fuel uh, north and south of the border. And of course, this has been um, added to by the fact that the UK Chancellor has announced that he will postpone uh, increases in fuel excise taxes for the next 12 months. So that really uh, makes a huge difference to retailers who are literally hanging on by their fingernails, trying to survive mm. uh, uh, you know, who are trying to sell uh, petrol and diesel. Can I add to that, if you don't mind? And some of this might be might not be legally right or morally right, but, you know, the fact is remains it may well happen. At this point now, what's to stop me going? Do you know what? I wouldn't mind going into the north, and while I'm there, I'll fill up the car, I'll buy myself a six-pack can of Coke, uh, because there won't be 15 cents on it a can, and while I'm there, I'll chuck in a bag of dirty coal into the boot. As I say, that's not legal, right? Don't get me wrong. Uh, I, and I'm not even going into the groceries and that side of things, right? I don't know what the cost differential is there. But again, it, it starts, sort of people start going, well, stuff it, we'll do our weekly shop in the north. Do you know what I mean? When you add all of these things on. You're exactly right. Uh, it's it's the little bits, whether it's um, the, the cost of the petrol or diesel, and people say, well, look, you know, the, the, the cost of going to the north will be negated by the fact that my uh, petrol or diesel is cheaper. So therefore, I need to look at the prices, the price differential. And if it's worth my while, I go, I mean, that's human nature. There's a lot of people and every... 50 cent makes a difference, never mind every euro or two. And they're looking at that because 
People have only so much disposable income, and at the end of the day, they have to look where they spend it. And it, it's, and I think it's important to say as well that uh, the increase in excise uh, just doesn't affect businesses, though that's absolutely crucial. And, and just to to concentrate on that, maybe for a second, um, you know, a lot of these businesses on the border. Uh, don't just provide fuel for people. They, they also maybe have a small coffee shop or something. And, and they're often part of the, the whole social area in the small towns and villages. And to lose that isn't just about losing employment, though that's critical. It, you know, it isn't about businesses going out of business. And at the end of the day, the state gets less tax because of that. But it's also about the fact that they are sometimes nearly the, the only social outlet in a local village mm. or town. And unless you're living close to the border and you understand that, then you don't understand the value of it. But it's also for individuals themselves, the cost of fuel and what it adds to inflation. Yeah, and there's so, businesses too, businesses uh, as well. But unfortunately, uh, Marion, we can discuss about it and people will agree with you, but it still persists. Do you know what I mean? Even in a cost of living crisis over Easter weekend, people's bills went up for broadband, TV services, the cost of petrol, diesel went up, health insurance went up, uh, and, and people huff and puff and, 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 and the government still persists, even as I say, we're told it's well, the con economy's doing well, but people are struggling. Well, certainly um, I have raised it, as I said, back last year, because I could see what was coming down the tracks. And I think if you don't live uh, close to the border or if you're not aware of the implications of the price difference, then it's sort of just it's a blur to you and you don't see it as being important. Okay. And uh, because the UK Chancellor made that announcement that the UK wasn't going to uh, increase their excise duty, then we need to look at it here. And it's not so much that we need to follow what the UK is doing. It's not that. It's that we need to look at the impact okay. on customers, but also on businesses. Businesses and that, yeah, that uh, support communities. Look, so with all that in mind, this was a government decision. Uh, people are going to want me to ask you the question, are you, I'm not sure if you're on the record yet, are you supporting Simon Harris? I'm on the record from about two and a half, three weeks ago when I spoke in the Dáil after uh, Leo Varadkar announced his resignation. I will not be supporting, at that time we didn't know who it was, any new T-shirt. Are you going to we meet him? No, I, I, it's not that I'm not going to or I am going to. He hasn't contacted me and I haven't contacted him. And let me say, you know, I worked well with Simon Harris in higher education, but this isn't about that. This is about the direction that the country is taking. And um, I made it very clear in the doll two, two and a half weeks ago that I would not be supporting a new T-shirt. Everybody's talking about 12 months to an election. There isn't. The doll must be dissolved by the 19th of February, which when we go back is 10 months. If it's that late, we're still into the teeth of an election after Christmas, so there'll be nothing done. We're now into the teeth of two elections and a referendum in June. So again, uh, while I look, Simon uh, Harris has work to do to refocus Fine Gael and what they're doing, and that's fine for him and for them. But I'm looking at what the country needs, and it doesn't need new ministers who won't have time to get their feet under the table just to establish their credentials and their name. We need to see the, where the country is going. And after uh, being in government since 2011, Fine Gael have to go to the people on their record okay. and let people decide what's going to happen. So pardon uh, my ignorance, does that mean you, you're obviously not voting in favour of, of him? Do, do, is it uh, an, an abstention or you vote against him as Taoiseach? Oh, I vote against him. And as I said, I didn't wait for, for anything I just I made that decision two and a half weeks ago because of where we are in the electoral cycle. I voted for this government day one because they were the only possible option. The people voted, they, they made their decision. It wasn't up to me to second guess that. I had to look and see what was the only viable option for government, okay. and it was the current government. But they have now, um, if it, at best, there's 10 months left with 
to elections, a referendum, and then a general election. Mm. How much we, how much business time is there actually? Very little. OK, Deputy Marion Harkin on both issues, thank you so much for your time. Thanks. Bye-bye. OK, so uh, I presume a number of you would have been wanting me to ask, is her vote for sale, in inverted commas? And the answer there is uh, no. She's on the record for a couple of weeks saying that. Uh, Greg, will you ask Marion Harkin if she's supporting Simon Harris for tea shop? The answer there is uh, no. That's one of the reasons why Northern Ireland won't vote for a united Ireland. Why would they? Joining us to get shafted again. You see, this is this is what it's going to come down to, you know, the, the, the nitty-gritties of it, the financials of it for some. Uh, and that's us up here uh, in the North uh, and in the North in the Republic as well. Um, whereas down South, you know, you can see how much interest they have uh, in us. Not an awful lot, uh, it would seem, from time to time. Well, certainly national policies are, are introduced and the negative impacts they may have on the border often don't feel uh, they are um, considered. Right, OK. Uh, the lights were inspected by the FAI six weeks ago um, to say that the lights weren't viable. OK, I'm not sure of the timeline of it. Um, I don't have time actually to go through any more comments. That's coming up after we take a break now for the news and obituary notices. Don't go anywhere. Skoda cars are made for exploring Ireland. But let's add more style, more sexiness, more French. Skoda Fabia, Scala and Kamek models are available in the Monte Carlo range. Black exterior details, excusez-moi, sports seats and bumpers, enchanté, and carbon decor. So chic. Order your new 2024 Skoda with more je ne sais quoi at skoda.ie. Skoda, let's explore. Your local Skoda dealer is DMG Motors, Clare Road, Donegal Town. Telephone 074 97 21396 or visit dmgmotors.ie. Do you need a little extra help staying in your home? At Bluebird Care, we offer a wide variety of QMARC approved personalised home care services across Donegal. And our fully trained and committed staff will always meet your care needs with kindness, compassion, and dignity. To get your personal home care assessment plan, visit bluebirdcare.ie or call our care team today on 07491 29562 and bring care home. BNS Credit Union, your money's friend. Helping dreams come true from start to end. For innovations, weddings or a degree. We're the ones you can trust. Come and see. Planning a wedding or a holiday spree. Or maybe a car for adventures to be. BNS Credit Union, we've got your back with loans tailored for your life's track. Visit bnscu.ie. Your journey starts. BNS Credit Union, where dreams depart. Join us today and let's make it right. With BNSCU, your future's bright. BNS Credit Union Limited is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. The Big Easter Sale is now on at Cooney's Home Interiors with 20% off all departments, excluding existing offers. That's huge discounts on all suites, tables, beds and accessories. We have many X-Display models in beds and sofas all reduced to clear. Treat yourself to a bargain at the Easter Sale in Cooney's Home Interiors, Letterkenny Retail Park. Sale ends Sunday the 7th of April. Live on air, online and on the Highland Radio app. This is Highland Radio News. Good morning, I'm Michaela Clark with the news at 10 o'clock. It's emerged sick people on Tory Island needing medical attention on the mainland are being transported to a waiting helicopter in work vans. Just two islands in Ireland have access to an ambulance on the island. They are Arnmore and Ornmore. In one recent case on Tory Island, an elderly woman was transported to the island's helipad in the back of a van surrounded by work tools. Councillor Michal Colmigal Asbuk says it's totally unacceptable for the HSC to put responsibility on islanders to provide a service they should be providing. He says islanders deserve equal care. People of the islands should have the same respect and dignity as the people of the mainland. Under no circumstances would we accept that's when somebody has an accident or somebody seriously ill and we call out an ambulance that we say, listen, go and get Mary a Paddy's work van. She will transport them to Lidicamney on the back of a van. That's not acceptable. We wouldn't accept that. So why would the island community accept that? 
Over 1,000 people have signed a petition calling for a new health centre in Kilmacrennan. The health centre in the village has been closed since January the 29th, with locals having to travel to Milford to seek medical care if needed. A public meeting at the weekend heard the need for health services to be restored to the locality. Councillor Michael McBride says the removal of services from rural parts of the county cannot be accepted. If that um, existing centre can't be reopened, then it's my opinion... We need to look for a brand new centre for Kilmacrellan because it is a growing centre of population and I think it's unacceptable that all these services have been stripped out of rural towns and villages and been put into uh, larger towns. A united Ireland could mean austerity like tax hikes and spending cuts for those living south of the border. The Institute of International and European Affairs has done an evaluation of the costs associated with reunification. It's found that spending would have to be slashed and taxes raised for workers to fund it. Report author John Fitzgerald says take-home pay could plummet by as much as 25%. I think it would be more likely there would be an increase in taxation. Um, so that um, we'd have much less to spend. Um, so if you think of the amount you pay in tax, <laughs> add a quarter onto that. Finn Harp says a floodlight failure at Finn Park is further evidence that the move to a new stadium is vital for the survival of the club. Following consultation with the FAI, Finn Harp's match against UCD this Friday will kick off at the earlier time of 5pm due to the floodlight failure. The system failed the pre-match test last evening because the wrong components were delivered to repair the system, which has been causing problems at home games this season. Ian Campbell, commercial officer at Finn Harp's football club, told today's 19 noon show that ways to finance the upkeep of the club into the future need to be found. It's past its sell by date Greg you know we've been very open about that it's just not a modern stadium so we could spend money we don't have a lot of it to spend on it so we need to really look to the future now and you know we go back to the, to the beauty of being a fan owned club and a service as well but we'll have an EGM soon to discuss you know other options about how we finance it going forward because they're expensive things to run. The government is set to clamp down on the renewal of provisional licences for those who repeatedly fail their driving test. Junior Transport Minister Jack Chambers says the issue is a road safety priority for him and is being dealt with. The department has plans to prevent unlimited renewals, increase testing capacity and review driver training to better prepare test candidates. Brenda Bolger of Bolger School of Motoring says this issue isn't necessarily limited to young people, as some may think. For your first two learner permits, they are for two years each, so that's four years. So if you've been on your learner permits for a long time, in essence, you're talking about 12 years. So the age profile of this person is a minimum of someone heading into their 30s at this stage. So it's definitely something needs to be addressed because if you're driving on a provisional license for 10 to 12 years, is driving for you? Weather now today will be mainly dry and mostly cloudy with a few bright intervals developing. Highest temperatures of 9 or 10 degrees. That's all from Highland Radio News for now. We'll be back with an update again at 11 o'clock. Until then, you can keep up to date with the latest local news on our website at highlandradio.com. Good morning. The obituary notice says for this Thursday morning, April the 4th. The death has occurred of Ellen Simmons, Crilly, Pettigo, County Donegal. Reposing at her home in Crilly, Pettigo, due day from 12 noon until 10 o'clock. Funeral in St Joseph's Church, Letcher Cran, Pettigo, tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock, with burial afterwards in the adjoining cemetery. Family flowers only, please. Donations, if desired, in aid of the Irish Motor Neuron Disease Association and Cardiac Unit at SWAH to Pat Britton, funeral director, or any family member. The death has taken place of Alice Leash Boyle Ney McGrath, 40 St Coleman's Drive, Straban, and formerly of Cyan Mills, reposing at her home. Fiona leaving her home tomorrow morning at 25 past nine for Requiem Mass in St Mary's Church, Melmount at 10 o'clock. Interment afterwards in the adjoining cemetery. Family time please from 11 o'clock to 11 o'clock. The Requiem Mass can be viewed live via the parish webcam. 
The death has occurred of Mary Ann Boner, Molly Rowe, Duhury. Her remains are reposing at her son Michael's house with Rosary tonight at 10 o'clock. Funeral tomorrow at 12 noon in St Bridget's Church Lechermacka Ward with interment at the new cemetery. House private police from 11 o'clock to 11 o'clock and on the morning of the funeral. The death has occurred of Rose Byrne, nay Breslin, Roxburgh, Kilcar. Rose's remains are reposing at her late residence in Roxburgh, Kilcar. Removal from there to more morning at half past ten, going to St Carthus Church, Kilcar, for 11 o'clock funeral mass with burial afterwards in the local cemetery. Rose's funeral mass can be viewed on mcn.live. And the death has occurred of Ivy Carlin, nay Doherty, 47 Drumquin Road, Castle Derg, reposing at the family home. Funeral from the family home tomorrow morning at quarter past ten for Requiem Mass at 11 o'clock in St Francis of Assisi Church, Drumna Bay. Interment afterwards in the adjoining churchyard. The Mass can be viewed via the parish webcam. Family flowers only please donations in lieu if desired to cancer research, care of any family member. Family time please from 10 o'clock to 12 noon and on the morning of the funeral. For family information and more details regarding wakes and funerals, please go to highlandradio.com. The National Lottery Good Causes Awards celebrate the amazing work done in communities all over Ireland. We're now inviting entries for the 2023 awards. So if you've received National Lottery funding in the last five years, tell us all about the wonderful work you do and don't be modest. There's a €100,000 win prizes on the night and the food's not too shabby either. Closing date for entries is March 31st. You'll find out how to enter at lottery.ie. The National Lottery. Support responsibly. All right, good morning to you. You're very welcome back to the programme. Um, now, a caller says, will the new ministers be entitled to a ministerial pension even though they're in position less than 10 months? Well, let me find that out for you. Greg, when you change over from euro to pound, the cost the same. 171 euro equals 147 uh, pounds sterling. Well, that's currently as we're at now, you see, but there will be variations. But uh, I think really the warning is, is that we're at that tipping point where we could see sort of cross-border trade Maybe we're not just quite there yet. Ask Marion Harkin why we cannot take the same approach as Denmark, a state that opted out of the immigration pact and has massive success in reducing migration. Uh, 24 cans of Diet Coke, Coke Zero in Tesco, Northern Ireland, eight euro with the club card, 16 euro, uh, sorry, eight pounds with the club card, 16 euro plus here. All right, that's a big difference, isn't it? Uh, reunited Ireland. Does the report, I wonder, cost the economies of scale that Ireland would be profited in regarding administration and bureaucracy and double services, especially in health, council services, civil services, etc.? EU support funding. Uh, does it include the benefit to mental health of a more peaceful society and the peace dividend that would attract new investors? Plus, the great benefit of the fact that the democratic status of the island of Ireland has been ratified by uh, by the people of Ireland at last after being negated in 1918 when 72% of the electorate voted for United Ireland. How many billions, never mind lives, have been unnecessarily lost because of that terrible decision to divide Ireland? It is a detailed report. It does discuss British funding, EU funding uh, and what have you. Um, right, OK. Let me see. Uh, so the son of the most pro-British Taoiseach Ireland has ever had has produced a report to say a united Ireland is not financially viable now. There's a surprise. Well, that's not the conclusion of the report. The report, which is independent and not from this one single individual, is actually to lay out the costs so people can discuss it and, and have the debate. Uh, but they go on to say, love to hear a balanced debate on what he based that on. Also, you never mentioned the report. Uh, that showed that insurance payouts are down by one-third and premiums are up by 8%. The minister commenting calls that a success and says that he'll continue to work hard to bring down premiums, no doubt the same as he's working hard for defective concrete homeowners and young people looking to buy houses. Uh, a number of uh, comments on... Um, the future of crease. I'll get to those in a moment. Another caller says economic reports are twisted to suggest unity is impossible. Why is Greg believing the ESRI reports for government? Is Greg anti the reunification of Ireland? No. Um, 
It's a report that has been uh, conducted and the research and the backup is there. I don't know what it means. I'm not sure. Is 20 billion a year, does that mean we can't afford it? The country can afford it. Uh, potentially, we afforded COVID. Uh, we afforded the bank bailout. The bank bailout proved that we could actually afford this um, because that was a multiples of uh, billions in a very short period of time. We're talking 20 billion a year. So uh, it's just where the conversation is going to be, the practicalities of it. Even, you know, the delivery of cancer services in the Northwest, would that be Derry, would that be Leather Kenny, would that be both who would travel where, so on and so forth. Just the realities of uh, merging to to uh, different, uh, at the moment, to uh, countries run very differently together. I don't know why we should shy away from such a conversation or even by having it could be deemed as being anti-reunification, but uh, there we are. Back with more after these. The county's number one talk show, the nine till noon show on Highland Radio. It's time for Vision Ireland Bingo on Highland Radio. It's Thursday, April 4th. Playing on a pink sheet, reference number is S9, it's week 14. Today is jackpot day. The jackpot number is 37 and must appear as one of the following 10 daily numbers. Today's numbers are 67, 4, 22, 10 20 43 14 23 17 and 65 Phone your claim to 9104833 before 8 tonight, leaving your name, contact number and the name of the shop where you purchased your book. Get all your Vision Ireland bingo information at highlandradio.com all you need to make your house a home at Patterson's The Hall Lifford. From garden furniture to kitchens, sofas and dining sets, all under one roof. Need a new mattress? Why not visit our sleep centre on the first floor? With a large range of quality beds and mattresses in stock and ready for collection or delivery. Relax in our coffee shop serving hot lunches daily. Open Monday to Saturday, 9am to 5.30pm. Patterson's Kitchens and Interiors, The Hall Lifford. Get ready to experience the ultimate tribute to the king of rock and roll. The Elvis Spectacular Show is coming to Encourage Hotel on Saturday, April 27th. Tickets priced at €25 Euro are available from Eventbrite and Encourage Hotel Reception. Celebrate exceptional businesses in Donegal. Nominate your favourite for the Highland Radio Customer Service Awards in association with McElhenney's Department Store. Our Customer Service Awards celebrate the businesses that go above and beyond to provide excellent customer service. To nominate your favourite business, simply visit highlandradio.com, fill out the nomination form and tell us why you love this business. The winners will receive recognition at our special award ceremony on June the 9th. Plus, they'll have the satisfaction of knowing that they made a positive impact on their customers. Nominate now. Nominations close 23rd of April. Now, our next guest on the programme is Dr. Diane Daly, Director of Physical Analysis at Forensic Science Ireland. Good morning to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning. It's great to have you with us. Can you talk to us about the work of uh, Forensic Science Ireland before we uh, talk about some advances in the work that is done there? Sure, Greg. Um, Forensic Science Ireland is going to celebrate its 50th year next year. Uh, we were founded in 1975 with um, two to three people. And in those 50 years, we have grown um, to employ over 210 people in the laboratory. Um, our staff are scientists, so science graduates. We have forensic scientists and we have forensic analysts. And then we also have a team of administrative staff that help us move exhibits around the um, um, laboratory and to issue our reports. And in a typical year in Forensic Science Ireland, we get somewhere in the region of 23,000 cases. And those that's broken down into roughly around 10,000 cases where they are looking for drugs and toxicology analysis, around six and a half thousand where they're looking for DNA analysis, and then six and a half thousand where they're looking for the physical methods, which is the area that I'm the, the director over. And in that area, we look at fingerprints analysis primarily, 
chemistry cases and documents and handwriting. And chemistry cases are um, trace evidence cases, and they would involve things like uh, fire accelerants, um, fire and residue, paint, fi uh, flex, fibers, glass, and um, um, and footwear. Mm -hmm. analysis all very important uh elements particularly the physical side well not exclusively but particularly the physical yeah. side of things when building a case uh because often we would have guardi on say for an example uh diane whereby they've arrested someone and it seems like well it's a fait accompli but then they would make an appeal for further <laughs> information that's also is part of of building a case to to ensure a conviction i presume Yes. So Forensic Science Ireland sits very much um, as the scientists in that um, uh, passage of the case through the, the um, getting gaining enough information. And so our, our scientists do what we can and apply in scientific methods. We obviously are, um, you know, benchmarked against the best um, forensic scientists in Europe, and our job is to 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 deliver, you know, to best international standards, independent expert opinion, advice, and training, um, and obviously research to that criminal justice system. And our vision is science supporting justice. So we work together with Engarda Síochána, who is the investigative team, and they will submit some items to um, FSI and Forensic Science Ireland. And our job is to try and review those cases to see what is the best uh, analysis that we would carry out to get to get the most amount of information irrespective of whether it, it exonerates a person or is is able to substantiate what is um uh, known facts so um for us our job is to work with Engarda Síochána and to review those cases um in order to prepare a, a report that forms part of the book of evidence that goes then to the director of public prosecutions for them to decide as to what is the, the progress of all of the facts it's a very very complex issue and of course you know i suppose when it's being presented in the court it, it has to be complex but i suppose also too it has to be understandable because you are uh, often uh, asking 12 regular folks to to sort of understand what you're saying and give weight to it Correct. And part of the training of the forensic scientists is, is that they would receive courtroom training um, so that they can prepare courts in what we hope is simple language and understandable language. And whilst we are technical and we have robust standards and amongst experts, we have a certain scientific language, um, which is very important for understanding. We also understand that when we're speaking um, uh, in court as expert witnesses and delivering evidence that it's vital that that it is um, understood and that there's no opportunity for misinterpretation of any of the results that, mm -hmm. that we might give. And so being a forensic scientist is really around being able to explain how significant the results are that we obtain from the tests that we do. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people's understanding or view or interpretation of what a forensic scientist is would have been learned from pro programmes like CSI and, and, and others. And I think you really have, uh, to, to uh, some extent, explained that it's not really like that, that it's part there, that uh, the forensic science is, uh, is a strand of the sort of investigative process and uh, can't sort of really stand on its own as such. Correct. And, you know, often perhaps people in the general public think that forensic science solves cases. And I suppose that's that's one aspect. We assist in investigations and what we what we we have technology, so, something like databases. So we obviously we have a DNA database and we have a fingerprint database. So we have tools at our fingertips in order to help us to um, get investigative leads. But the, the, the investigative lead needs to sit in the context mm. of, of, the, of the case. And the example of that would be the cold case there, the, the, um, the murder of Noor Sheehan. And, you know, you know, in the reporting of that and the bringing of that case to trial, it was very much part of, um, you know, understanding that... Um, uh, Noah Long was in the area at the time. So then the forensic sits around what was recovered from the clothing 
of Nora, the fibres that were found to be matching the carpet in the car, and then also the paint, then also matching and um, paint flex in the car. But altogether, those investigative leads from the paint analysis, the fibre analysis, some DNA analysis was carried out, as well as uh, Noah Long being in the area. So it's a composite picture mm -hmm. that's brought together, and you know, it's that's that's a that's that really is science supporting justice. Mm -hmm. We're working together with the investigative teams from Angarda Shiakana. And sometimes the approach from Angarda Shiakana is, is that they're seeking our assistance, for instance, where we apply, um, uh, you know, the, the, the tool of a, of a database to help them find some investigative leads where they have nothing. And then other times our job is to corroborate what the facts that they have um, established and also to exonerate um, people. Okay, and in in the case of of uh, uh, Noel Long and uh, the murder of uh, Nora Sheehan, in terms of sort of uh, fiber analysis and and paint analysis, I presume like we're talking potentially you could potentially I'm not sure in this case talking almost microscopic materials that's being an analysed here. Yes. So in forensic science, um, we have a term called trace and trace evidence can be explained as a small amount of material um, in the presence of a bulk amount of material. Um, it can also be a tiny flex. So a paint fleck and a, um, a fiber in microscopic um, um, size of, of detail. And so you need precision from your forensic scientist in order to observe the fibers and to to recover the, that trace evidence from um, clothing that's submitted for examination. And then you need that um, detailed observations and examinations mm -hmm. with the help of low power and high power microscopes where they can help you differentiate and discriminate that trace evidence from a back from background mm -hmm. source. And you have and to be so detailed, didn't it, don't you? Because, you know, people on the other side of the case, they also have access to experts potentially that will try and discredit such uh, information. You know, it's not just taken as uh, it's not just taken as fact all the time. Do you know what I mean? So Correct. it has to be it has to be scientifically robust and provable and demonstrable uh, or else it could just be untangled in, in, in the courtroom. Correct. Any report and any examinations that forensic science um, conduct is open to review by a defence scientist on the side of, of the defence. Um, what we do in order to maintain our standards is that um, all our scientists participate in proficiency trials and competency. We have ongoing professional development. We're networked with other European network forensic um, institutes uh, and our scientists attend meetings um, at least once a year um, in their chosen areas area of trace evidence where it's an opportunity for science to discuss the science amongst peers and to benchmark your procedures and also to benchmark your results and to know that you are uh, as we say providing robust scientific mm. methods to the best technology available for the citizens of Ireland. So um Obviously, there's a huge workload, as you've mentioned, and I presume a lot of those are, are recent and current cases, and we have been referencing uh, what, what can be described as a cold case. So with advances in technologies, you know, the pressure comes on, does it, from investigative guardies, you know, that one case that that that, that perhaps uh, uh, that, that wasn't solved, or even there could be people listening to us right now who... who um, you know, believe someone was responsible for a crime against them or someone in their family and they're listening now and going, right, okay, well, if there's advances in sort of technology or, or how we do things, can we relook at that case? Um, so in other words, you, you know, advances can create issues as well in terms of how do you or who determines, you know, what cold case can be revisited with effect? Um, well, Greg, I think that's a very good question that you answer, you, you pose there because what the way the cold case reviews um, happen is that it's very much part of uh, um, a review by the Garda Investigative Cold Case Review Team and forensic scientists together sitting down. And what they do is is they each bring their expertise and they review each case and its own particular circumstances because there are limitations and opportunities with cold cases. And so the opportunities are to re-examine ex exhibits and items or to re-examine samples 
examples that were taken at the time and we can apply advances that have been made in with the passage of time and those advances can be that you've better instrumentation something like a better microscope gives you a clearer image and um, maybe a digital output and you can do um, much more and, and process samples in a faster time however the limitations to case review is, is that we do many more cases in forensic science ireland than, than we actually get that one um success that could bring a case such as the murder of Nora Sheehan. So yes, Forensic Science Ireland is mm. all the time reviewing cases along with the Guard investigative team to choose the ones where they will benefit from those okay. advances in technology because modernity is fine, but you can't do it in, res in retrospect. Mm. You must, you know, what we have to say is what do we have? Does this case afford itself to be one that we mm -hmm. could have a success with? Well, with all and that in mind too, how good are we, Diane, uh, and I'm not asking you to, to, to be critical of, 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 of people you might work with, whatever, but historically, how good are we at, at, at storing evidence whereby it can be accessed uh, and also it's stored in a way where there is no sort of potential cross-contamination? I presume from now going forward, we have to be very good at it. I just wonder, I mean, we've seen some very high uh, profile cases where some very large uh, uh, pieces of evidence have, have, have disappeared off the face of the earth. But are we, how, are, how have we been historically in A, you know, storing and retaining uh, evidence that can be uh, maybe returned to and also B, in a way that uh, this, this cross-contamination doesn't perhaps destroy potential evidence? Yeah, well, the, the chain of custody and the preservation of evidence through the passage of time is definitely one of the challenges of cold cases because people retire, people move jobs. And so, you know, some of the information specific to cases um, can can be lost um, with the past. People can die. Um, uh, Garda members, forensic scientists, unfortunately. So it is it is obviously one of the challenges of, of, of um, cold case review. And that's where I mean we have to look at the case circumstances in the mm. round mm -hmm. and and choose which ones are the ones that we can actually get to a point where is there is advances and more results and new results um are obtained that it, there is the potential then to take this case through to prosecution um and that would be part of um the you know discussions with obviously the dpp and the yeah. guard investigation teams and ourselves um so yes so preserving the continuity um and we you know like everything we are we get better of these things once awareness is raised. So whilst you and I are talking about cold cases today, the cold cases have been going on in Forensic Science Ireland for a while now mm -hmm. and within Angarda Sheikhana. So I think already um, the, the thought processes are turned to we must preserve as much evidence as we can in certain cases where there is the potential for advances at some point in time mm -hmm. to be able to assist. Uh, and just very finally, has artificial intelligence entered this space uh, for us yet do you anticipate that it will i mean obviously a lot of this stuff now uh you, you know you need that human touch but i presume there are areas where you know this i don't think there is an area actually where ai will not have a role into the future is that being discussed amongst you and your peers at this point um, yes, uh, AI is something that is being discussed. Um, like you said, it's not fully implemented yet in any um, aspect of forensic science. Um, but where most advances might be seen in in um, AI that we could see maybe be in the emergence of it in forensic science is possibly in document examination and handwriting examination, whereby there are certain security features that it might uh, be in, a, a say, a passport to authenticate that that is is a genuine Irish passport. And sometimes it does not need a human eye in order to see that those features are present or mm. absent. So some, some some like something like an AI reader, so just like a barcode reader, can scan a document and that document can be verified by AI that all of the security features that are required to be present are there. Okay. Um, so that that's something that we might see coming into the future. Yeah, for sure. Fascinating stuff. Uh, an, an area of... Uh, um, you would encourage people to get involved in, is it, uh, Diane? 
Oh gosh, yes. So science, um, the science, technology, engineering and maths. So there are the STEM um, uh, subjects that uh, Forensic Science Ireland want young young people to embrace, particularly the chemistry. Um, I myself am a graduate of Ulster University and um, biological sciences, and I have a doctorate in genetics from biological from um, Ulster University. So obviously a big proponent of general science degrees, getting people um, equipped with the basic skills of logic and decision making and good scientific um, judgment and um, yes FSI is recruiting on an onward basis because we have reached that 40 year cycle and we've got people retiring um, and recruiting and we've moved to a new purpose built facility and so we're also expanding our workforce. Brilliant stuff. All right, Diane, it's been really interesting. Thanks very much for your time. Bye now. Bye. That's Dr. Diane Daly, who's Director of Physical Analysis at Forensic Science Ireland. So it's not really like CSI, the TV show. It's not terribly removed from it either. OK, your voice, your community on the way. McDade's Bathroom Plumbing and Tile Showroom in Bunkrana is your one-stop solution for all your bathroom plumbing and tile needs. We offer a wide range of top quality plumbing fixtures, tiles and accessories, all at the best possible price. Our experienced plumbing experts will help you choose the right products for your bathroom, renovation, new construction or remodeling project. Visit McDade's Bathroom Plumbing and Tiles in Bunkrana and see why we are the best choice for all your bathroom and plumbing and tile needs. Step out of the ordinary and into the new Lexus LBX because this is the luxury compact SUV reimagined in every detail where style, elegance and innovation define a new kind of driving experience. It's your world. Make it extraordinary. Experience the new LBX hybrid at your Lexus retailer available with a range of flexible payment options. Lexus. Experience amazing. Your local dealer is Lexus Letterkenny. Colm here from Sweeney's Home Value Builders Providers, Lettermack Award and Derry Big. Are you starting a new build or planning a renovation anytime soon? Why not give us a call today for quotation for all your building needs? Will there steel or insulation, timber or slates? We have it all at Sweeney's Builders Providers, Lettermack Award and Derry Big. Call 074 95 44 114. And now with delivery all across Donegal, at Sweeney's Builders Providers, we have it all. It's time to transform your smile with the help of Blue Poppy Dental Letterkenny in Donegal Town. Their expert team offer orthodontics, teeth whitening, implants and composite bonding all in-house. Start your journey by calling 074 97 40404 or easily book your appointment online at a time that suits you through their user-friendly patient portal. Available anytime, anywhere at bluepoppydental.com. Blue Poppy Dental and Orthodontics, Letterkenny and Donegal Town. Gift vouchers available. For day-to-day -day healthcare needs, generations have trusted the experienced staff at McGee's Chemist Letterkenny. From coughs and colds to aches and pains, from vitamin supplements to first aid essentials. McGee's have what you need, when you need it, with a full prescription service available daily. McGee's Chemist Main Street Letterkenny. For healthcare help and advice you can always trust. Now on this week's Your Voice, Your Community, funded by Commissioner Mann, we speak to John Richard. Good morning to you, John. Hi, good morning. How are you? It's good to have you on the programme. And Raj. Good morning, Raj. Morning. Uh, both are members of the Tamil speaking community in uh, Donegal. And we're going to talk about um, something being launched um, very, very shortly. Uh, 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 well, I'll talk about that in a moment. But just to get know Raj and John a little bit better. Uh, is it John Richard or John? Is John is Richard your surname? or? Yeah, it's a long name. I have another name as well, but I got <laughs> shot into John Richard. <laughs> Yeah, so you okay. can call me John or Richard. Well, I'll stay with me. you, John. Um, Tamil, uh, as a language, is it s simply a language? Is any language simply a language or, or is there more to it? I would say Tamil, uh, you know, it's called as language, but we can consider Tamil as a culture. It's a tradition. It's a thought process and uh, it, it's arts form and it has everything together. So as a Tamil, uh, you know, we have got about eight, eight, 80 million people, those who speak Tamil across the world, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, as I said, you know, predominantly it's, it's a language, but we can call 
that as a culture, tradition mm. and art form. And um, it is Raj spoken in many countries, southern India, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, some of Africa. So, uh, you know, there are, is some com- uh, yeah, some common ground there and then there's cultural differences as well the land the language we'll call it that sort of supersedes that yes but tamil has been spoken in quite a number of countries and we have a place back in india called tamil nadu that tamil nadu means the land of the tamils that's a place where tamil originated but it's spread across the world and even if you go to malaysia you can speak in tamil and they'll understand you there may be slight variation in the accent and how they use some words but it is the same uh, word uh, language the same as Which, irish you can speak to someone from galway yes. or scaliga and in donegal fundamentally yes it's the same but there are variances as well i like the letterkenny accent compared to say place like sligo because they talk <laughs> rapid fire which i can't i had, i know a friend of mine who i know for the past 22 years i can still only follow 50% of what he says. He um, looks like go. Now, <clears throat> when you moved to Donegal, where are you originally from, Raj? I am from the state of Tamil Nadu. I come from a place called Kunnur. Mm-hmm. That is quite high up in the mountain. So I'm very comfortable living in Letterkenny. You like our hills. Yes. You can, you can It's almost reminds go, me of Go home. halfway up Errigal and feel just at home. Yes. Um, but were you the first arrival uh, member of the Tamil community? Uh, Because it... it Unfortunately, there were two or three other boys who had come here in yeah. 2001. But they are no longer living in Letterkenny. And they are gone to Dublin. So I'm, I think I'm the f- oldest... Surviving in, member. <laughs> surviving member in terms of age as well as staying in Letterkenny. But I would say young in thoughts. Huh? You would I say? I would say young, young in thoughts. Okay. <laughs> I get you right. And um, so what... Uh, John, is is the Donegal Tamil community then? Do you know, how do you uh, identify e- each other, if you know what I mean? What's the commonality there? Other than the language and what have you, do you pray together? Do you meet up and, I don't know, talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, usually, you know, by the language, we understand and recognize yes. each other. And also we conduct programs, you know, uh, once a while, you know, at least uh, three times in a year, especially during the... Uh, spring season you know during the april and also we usually conduct some something in june or july and mm-hmm. also in october or november so these are the three programs our four programs that we get together we have our own lunch you know cooked by our, our member com, uh, community members sometimes we order food and also with a lot of cultural activities that we do this is to rejuvenate you know our 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 thought process in tamil also bring in the people together to celebrate the heritage mm. does that celebrate. bring you is that your connection to home though uh, as well to some extent uh sorry uh, you, you know the tamil community obviously you live and work here in letter kenny but i mean obviously we all uh, we all sort of want to retain our cultures and, and what have you is this your connection to home do you, is that how it feels for you yeah that's right yeah yeah so so what, what we want you know any tradition or any culture should be protected and you know preserved right even though we move out from our mm-hmm. motherland to another another place we have to protect our culture and the language so as as we move on uh, sometimes people turn to forget the language but by the language only we can identify ourselves and also the culture yeah. brings in kind of heritage to us so 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 we wanted to connect in that way well the language is in good standing with 80 million speakers worldwide is it in decline is it static is it in, is its usage increasing i wonder it used to be declined but now for, you know people got awareness and uh, people uh, moved elsewhere they are st- you know they have started protecting the language mm. you know that you would you would heard about you know we 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 have our our tamil book written in uh, you know ireland that is that is from that is from donegal i would say i'm the i am the author <laughs> proudly say say that in a way that uh, uh, the language is being protected uh, it's not declined uh, uh, but but what we wanted to ensure us you know unlike any other language we have to make sure that that is spoken it's written. used if yeah. you use it or lose it correct uh, we say. don't want to lose it yeah raj 
you, you've been here for a very long time now. You moved to Letterkenny 22 years ago. Obviously, you know, other people that you knew at the time have decided to go to the city or wherever. Right. Uh, why did you choose Letterkenny or what drew you to Letterkenny? Did you come for a, a, a job or did you come seeking work? Or Because it is it is a big change. Yes, uh, because before coming to Ireland, I was uh, working in Singapore. And at that time, I got to know one of my friends was working here in Letterkenny. Yes. So that's how I came and joined Promerica in those days. That time I had no idea about Ireland. When I I just know it is just near the UK, that's all. Mm. So when I came here, that was the reason, I, just for a job. So I came here. And at that time there were only about four, four of us who spoke Tamil. Mm-hmm. And we'd be thrilled to hear Tamil being spoken like in Tesco, the old Tesco, which was a small place. There once three of us were talking loudly in Tamil without nobody will understand. Suddenly, if somebody comes and talks to us, he says, you speak Tamil. I said, yes. And we thought he was from India. He was actually from Malaysia. Mm-hmm. So he also spoke. So th- there were two, pe- two uh, people from different countries speaking the same language. And uh, John, you'll be here 10 years next year. Uh, did you come for work in Optum or what What? what uh, interested you about Ireland? Uh, actually, I uh, I came to work for Primerica, the, you know, now it is TCS, right, uh, Tata Consultancy Services. Uh, I was not looking for a job, but uh, looks like my profile was on LinkedIn and Primerica was looking for an, a work. person like my, you know, uh, my, my, my expertise. And they were searching for a kind of expertise for six months. They couldn't find, finally, the HR from Primerica contacted me over the phone. Then I thought, yeah. Well, you, you weren't in Ireland at that point? No, no, no. You were living at, at in in India. India, and yeah. they contact you from LinkedIn and said we have a position here. Yeah, correct. Yeah, you know I lived in Malaysia for a, quite a while, mm. uh, maybe eight, nine, sorry, eight years. Then I moved into Hyderabad, and we were looking for some opportunity to explore the Western world. Mm-hmm. You are uh, both of you are from a different cultural background, right? What's it, and both even yourselves are probably from different cultural backgrounds. But what is it like moving in? I'll ask you, Raj, first. What is it like moving then into sort of you know a completely different sort of environment where people dress differently, they act differently, they behave differently, they speak differently? Um, what what's that experience like? I I, I would say I, I didn't find much of a difference. Okay, because the place where I come from, Kunur. The school where I studied, it was run by a group of uh, brothers. They were known as the Brothers of St. Patrick. Okay. So they were they were the Patrician brothers. They are, I think they are based in Kildare. They are the people who came and started the school. So we got used to the way they dress and we also following the same thing. So we didn't find, I didn't find it much of a... Yeah, you'd already had been, exp- been exposed to it. Exposed obviously. to it. So, and also because that was the school where they were teaching us in English. So due to that... My, I learned my English from the very first standard till I... From people from out. Kildare. Yes. <laughs> okay, that's right. <laughs> it so is a small world, isn't it? It's okay. a very small. I never <laughs> ever thought of coming here. And suddenly I found out the Brothers of St. Patrick are based in Ireland. Yeah. So but, I have also in, in some interesting story about myself. You know, actually, I was baptized by a Irish missionary who served in my village. Yes. Which is, uh, you know... My, my village is very down south in Tamil Nadu, and they had the missionaries uh, from Ireland, France, and everywhere. So for John Clayton, who is, I think, I'm not too sure exactly where he's from. I heard that he's from Galway area, and he gave me the name John Richard. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> and my parents wanted to include the name as Arokia, right? So that's how maybe... So what is your whole name, your full name? John, <laughs> John Arokia Richard. Okay. Right, three names, yes. and also we write our father's name as a surname. There is no surname concept in Tamil Nadu, so we we use our father's name as a surname. My father's name is Ritu, so usually people turn to call me as Ritu <laughs> as my father's name. Then I usually tell, no, my name is John Richard. If you want to call us Richard or John, you can call either way. Yeah, they're interchangeable, really. If you <laughs> if you yep. if you choose, okay. Yeah. Uh, now, the Tamil sp- speaking community are having a charity event in the regional cultural centre on uh, Saturday, the thirteenth of April. It's in aid of the Donegal Hospice. It's sold out, though, isn't it, Raj? Yes. Okay, so this full capacity, time- right? I, that the whole this is the first very first time this Donegal Tamil Villa that means Donegal Tamil Festival, we are having it and it's been sold out. And uh, one good thing is because 
we our the community is small in numbers in letter kenny but large in heart when they knew it was supposed to go the entire proceeds of the ticket sales is going to the donegal hospice we decided we are going to do it a few of us about five of us uh, formed the co committee and we are sponsoring the entire event so whatever money comes from the tamil community is going directly to the donegal hospice Mm-hmm. we like we always try to give back to the community wherever we are no and i know in the, in the past you, you raised money for the crystal tragedy um, yes. and also um other uh, charitable causes both inside and outside of ireland it really is quite fascinating i'm sure there are those that dispute it but uh, there the, the the school of thought is that tamil is the first known language to humans so once we got up onto our feet this is the language one we, of i always like to be one of them to save arguments like, raj one, one of the oldest you're, you're just trying to save <laughs> arguments here okay no but that is the language has been we still have it's still spoken the same way even if you compare 500 years somebody from about 500 years ago if he appears here and talks to me in tamil i'll be able to f- understand him and he'll be able to understand yeah. me so yeah. there is and it's we believe it to be a first a book written from the shores of Atlantic Ireland uh, the Atlantic of Ireland is the is the uh, the 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 English translation but this is thought to be the first Tamil uh, book by a Tamil author living in Ireland and it's going to be in the Irish Public Library uh, John yeah yeah that's right yeah so i used to write poems since my college days you know effectively and uh, after i moved in 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 ireland you know i i put in a lot of efforts to write more more uh, uh, poems as well as the articles you know i frequently write in social media as well so one of my friends told me that why not you publish a book because most of the writings about ireland and also uh, my thought process from ireland to connect my home homeland so so you know i would have written about 500 to 600 poems from 500 to 600 poems i selected about uh 100 poems and uh, published you know mm-hmm. uh, i got a good up op- you know good opportunity from donal uh, kelly you know who the was counselor, the counselor yeah yeah then mayor you know i went and attended a literature event uh in um uh, uh one of the hotels i forgot the name sorry then he asked me do you write poems yes i write poems have you published a book yeah i published a book then he asked me why can't you try in a uh, library because there is an opportunity for your book to be accepted in the library then i uh, approach the library uh, you know the librarian he said welcome most welcome okay. because this must be the first tamil book from donegal maybe in ireland so we can definitely proudly present that in the library that's how it went in brilliant okay yeah, well done congratulations yeah. it's a it's a fine achievement uh good luck with um good luck with the event that's taking place i'm sure as you say we've we've mentioned um the charity events what what is happening at that event of course it's only the 250 people raj that will be able to see because it's sold out uh yeah. but but what what will take place uh i presume poems we are, we are uh, we are getting performers from outside letter kenny to come and perform here because till this year always the events used to be in house we get the families to get their children and they come and do the dance song and dance everything but this time we thought okay let, let them all come here to just to relax and enjoy something so that they'll get to know about the tamil culture because we speak tamil but all this some of this uh, art forms are slowly getting forgotten mm. so now we are trying to bring them back so yeah, which brings ha- me back to the very first question is it a language or is it much more and and, and it's a, it's to retain the much more of we presume. consider tamil as a living language and we if it will surprise you but we do have a temple dedicated to tamil back in india mm-hmm. we call it mother tamil mm-hmm. so that is sort of it encompasses everything all art forms language everything is there brilliant that yeah greg one more information of course go ahead john yeah one more information on that right so if you look at the tamil uh, traditional music musical instruments we got about 100 over instruments maybe only 10 or 15 are in practice right now maybe we have to bring back all the you know traditional instruments mm. and also the d- dance forms we got about 25 dance for different dance forms and also that is also being forgotten when we talk about dance you know people would think about only you know maybe the uh, the bollywood or hollywood dance you know or you know kollywood dance we have much more beyond yeah. that you know we have to bring back that's why we have uh, identified a few people those who do well 
those kind of dances and we are maybe trying. next generation will be there and go yeah. i would like right. to, to 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 practice that That's yeah because works, basically yeah. there are a lot of boys or children who are born in ireland who are originally from tamil nadu they might not know all these art forms mm. so we want to show them these are the different instruments which are being used these are different art form and uh, dances music is right and you have to compete with everything else that they're exposed to as yes, well definitely. don't you it's 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 you know it's 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 uh it's the same okay listen raj it's been lovely having you in uh raj a member of the tamil speaking community the man of many names john richard rashi <laughs> <laughs> i won't try any others <laughs> yeah um also a member of the tamil speaking community an author and poet who writes in tamil as well and has his book uh present in the um in the library as well which is a a proud achievement i think for you and 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 your family both of you thanks very much it's been interesting really interesting and keep us updated with any future events it's been lovely having uh, both of you on thanks. that's raj and john that was your voice your community and we're back with more on the night alone show after the break are you ready for massive savings with AEG at Irwin Expert Electrical? Purchase from now until the 14th of April and claim your cash back at aeg-offers.com. Experience top-notch appliances and enjoy the added perk of cash back delivered straight to your account within 28 days of approval. Elevate your home with AEG excellence and savings today. Don't miss out. AEG cash back at Irwin Expert Electrical, Letterkenny and Bunkrana. Discover full and part-time courses from Level 2 to Master's degree at the College of Agriculture, Food and Rural Enterprise. CAFRI, Northern Ireland Specialist Agri-Food and Land-Based College with campuses at Greenmount, Antrim, Lowry, Cookstown and Enniskillen. Study a course in food, agriculture, horticulture, equine, floristry, veterinary, nursing, land-based engineering or business. Make a difference. Book now to attend an open day, Tuesday 9th to Saturday 13th of April. Visit cafre.ac.uk. I've been surfing all morning at FlemingLTD.com to find out about Fleming doors, Fleming steel and Fleming coatings and their full range of products. So come surfing with me at FlemingLTD.com. Fleming, 91 48 234. House to Home Bridge End, Donegal. Our modest front door opens onto two floors of Irish made furniture, suites, beds, mattresses, dining, and occasional furniture. Step into our showroom and see how we can transform your house into a home. House to Home Furniture, Flooring, Slide Robes, and Interiors, Bridge End, Donegal. O'Neill Sportswear Warehouse Clear and Seal is back in Strabane this week. We have major reductions on unmissable products. Find incredible deals on training gear, jerseys, shorts, and so much more. Don't miss out. O'Neill Sportswear Warehouse Clear and Seal in Strabane. Seal finishes Saturday the 6th of April. O'Neill's. Live for it. Visit Inishon Co-op Home Build Show at Inishon Gateway Hotel, Bonkrana on Saturday, April 13th, 11 to 5 p.m. Meet the suppliers for expert advice and all your home build needs. MICA supports available on the day. See Facebook for details. Highland Radio weather updates with McElhenney's. Support local at McElhenney's. With 53 years experience in fashion, beauty and home, we're here for you. Plus, enjoy M-Card rewards when you shop in-store at McElhenney's Bally Buffet. OK, quick look at the weather. Mainly dry, mostly cloudy with some patchy mist or drizzle at first and a few bright intervals developing temperatures 9 to 10 degrees. Now, you heard us referencing a report earlier on uh, as it relates to uh, the cost of a united ireland uh, trinity college professor and report author professor uh, john fitzgerald joins me on the program now john thank you so much for your time today i'm sure you're in great demand no problem now i'm not uh, i'm not sure if this is public perception or how it's been presented in the media but you, you know a, a number of contacts to us feel that this is kind of like an anti-unification document which i'm I, I i am sure it's not but can you understand as you know when we start talking about the cost per year increased taxation less spending that some people might perceive it as such um, yes, I can understand that. Now, I don't have a position on uh, Irish unification. I'd be dead before it happens. So um, it's of less immediate uh, uh, interest. So uh, there have been a series of papers, and this is one of a series, which look at what the cost would be. But of course, cost is only one issue. Um, but I think it is important 
that if people are going to consider having a referenda on unification, that they do consider the cost as well as all the other uh, benefits and costs. Yes, because uh, as I said on, on the show earlier, but I've said it for, for years now at this stage, it might be, you know, uh, uh, loyalism, unionism, uh, nationalism that might trigger the process. Uh, but really, I think an awful lot of the debate and conversation is going to be on the practicalities uh, of this. You know, when we get into the nitty gritties, that's probably what people will be voting on. Um, the conclusion of this paper and other papers is that there is a big gap in output per head in between Northern Ireland and the Republic. And Northern Ireland could do a lot to change that by in particular reforming their education system and there are other changes that they need to make. If they make those changes, the benefits would be occur over the next 20 years, which would narrow the gap very substantially. It would make a United Ireland easier and less costly, or it would make for a much more successful Northern Ireland within the United Kingdom. Um, you don't have to take a unionist position or a Republican position. Changing Northern Ireland to make it work um, is good for everybody. Uh, and, but it's how quickly that change might happen, either in advance or, or, or after. You know, we could look to the likes of Germany, I suppose. That's that's a, a, an example as to to uh, how two different uh, sort of two, two different societies merged in terms of, you know, uh, cost of living or, or wages and all that type of stuff. It's how it's done as well, really, isn't it? How did you factor that in? Yeah, well, uh, uh, we're only looking at the immediate change. If you transfer from uh, dependent on the UK Treasury for funding Northern Ireland to transferring to the people of Ireland funding themselves, what the effects would be. Over um, a 20, 30 year period, there would be major changes and there'd be con there'd be things that would go well there are things that would be uh, more difficult so we're looking at the immediate costs the overall economic effects are more complicated and we're not considering that that being said uh, even at 20 billion a year we probably could uh, afford it because we, we've been able to dig pretty deep in the past that will be uh, to a great expense uh, to the public um but also, too, there would be some benefits, but some disadvantages. Some of that more difficult to work out? Um, well, it, the, the immediate effects would be uh, pretty expensive. Um, um, like we, it, it, the, the uh, financial bailout costs Ireland a, a minimum of 60 billion. You're talking about 20 billion a year. So it's uh, a bailout every three years over a period of 10 to 20 years. That's a lot of money. Um, there, there are other political and social effects which um, you've got to take into account and which no doubt people in voting would take into account. But the fact that your standard of living is going to be substantially reduced in this part of the island um, would be um, a, a something that people would need to take into consideration in terms of uh, when and if uh, there is Irish unification. Uh, you, you talked of you know believing this happening in your lifetime. Um, you, I think there's uh, there's 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 plenty of life in you in you yet. So uh, what 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 realistically, the closer we get to it, potentially, do we end up pushing it out because of the complex nature of it? Um, well, if Northern Ireland got its act together today and made the necessary changes. It w you'd see a major improvement in productivity and a narrowing of the gap in 20 years. And at that stage, um, the costs of unification will be substantially reduced. But action has to be taken today. Like this research done by Vanny Barua, leading academic economist in Northern Ireland, the SRI last, last year, Seamus McGuinness, uh, Emer Smith, um, all of which points to problems in the educational system. We reformed, the Northern Ireland had a better education system than the Republic up to 1970. We brought in free secondary education with equal ac access. So if you're in Creaslock or Coot Hill or Chapel Lizard, you have equal opportunities. In Northern Ireland, at the age of 11, 60% of kids are sent to secondary schools where they're not really expected to go on to third level and a large number drop out. That is a huge cost to society in Northern mm -hmm. Ireland. So they need to integrate their their grammar schools and secondary schools. A very difficult uh, challenge for them. If they do that and provide equal opportunities in education, 
and it, 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 you'll see the benefits 20 years on because we made the change in 1970 and you see the Celtic Tiger in the 1990s. So it takes time for the kids who are being failed by the system today to be succeed in the system and grow up and then enter the labour market. That's why it's a long-term project. The one thing which Northern Ireland could do rapidly is uh, an awful lot of their graduates are people who, kids who went to university in England and don't come back. And the research shows it's the nature of the divided society is one of the things that stops them coming back. And if Sinn Féin and the DUP and Alliance got together and managed to persuade those graduates to come back to Northern Ireland, it could transform the economy and the society. But you have to persuade. Mm. You can't. This isn't just about money. It's about saying Northern Ireland is a great place to be rather than in England. Mm -hmm. I get to. Fascinating, uh, Professor, and uh, so much more we could dig into if we had more time, but we don't. My uh, my, my thanks for you uh, for your time this morning. Take care. That's uh, Professor John Fitzgerald there. With all the stories that matter across the Northwest, it's Greg Hughes on the 9 to Noon Show on Highland Radio. And I'm joined now by Michaela Clark, who has the latest news headlines at 11 o'clock. Thanks, Greg. Good morning. It's emerged sick people on Tory Island needing medical attention on the mainland are being transported to a waiting helicopter in work vans. Just two islands in Ireland have access to an ambulance on the island. They are Arnmore and Oranmore. In one recent case on Tory Island, an elderly woman was transported to the island's helipad in the back of a van surrounded by work tools. Over 1,000 people have signed a petition calling for a new health centre in Kilmacrenan. The facility in the village has been closed since January the 29th, with locals having to travel to Milford to seek medical care if needed. A public meeting at the weekend heard the need for health services to be restored in the locality. A united Ireland could mean austerity-like tax hikes and spending cuts for those living south of the border. The Institute of International and European Affairs has done an evaluation of the costs associated with, with reunification. It's found that spending would have to be slashed and taxes raised for workers to fund it. Finn Harp says a floodlight failure at Finn Park is further evidence that the move to a new stadium is vital for the survival of the club. Following consultation with the FAI, Finn Harp's match against UCD this Friday will kick off at the earlier time of 5pm due to the floodlight failure. The system failed the pre-match test last evening because the wrong components were delivered to repair the system, which has been causing problems at home games this season. The government is set to clamp down on the renewal of provisional licences for those who repeatedly fail their driving test. Junior Transport Minister Jack Chambers says the issue is a road safety priority for him and is being dealt with. The department has plans to prevent unlimited renewals, increase testing capacity and review driver training to better prepare test candidates. HICWA has found staff at a HSE-operated centre for people with mild and moderate intellectual disabilities in Donegal very knowledgeable on the needs and preferences of residents. This new and new residential facility near Donegal Town provides full-time residential care to three patients and one part-time resident with additional medical and social care needs. The report says staff in the centre had received human rights training and spoke about ways they offered residents daily choices, promoted their independence and involved them in the running of the the centre. And a yellow wind warning has been issued for the entire country on Saturday. Met Aaron is warning of very strong and gusty winds from 7am to 8pm. Motorists are advised to expect difficult travelling conditions and fallen trees while there's also a risk of coastal flooding. Those are the latest headlines. We'll be back with an update again at 12 noon. I think Jack Chambers in that story uh, might be missing the point. I don't think it's people are turning up and failing their tests all of the time they're not turning up for the tests yeah um, and then just renewing the license yeah but you know i mean there's not thousands of people for 20 years not passing the test yeah they're just the issue is, on is the they book the test they don't turn up and then they can renew the license yeah must get on to jack see if that's the story <laughs> thanks very much michaela those days are long behind me and you anyway fully licensed drivers okay back with more in the nine till noon show after we take a break 
join Homeland Nether Kenny's Garden Super Saturday this Saturday, 6th of April. Meet the expert Homeland Garden Centre team and enjoy exclusive offers in store, including Homeland Lawn, Feed and Weed. Buy two bags, get two and a half litre Homeland Lawn Hero free. Mobactor, Moss Remover, 20 kg, buy two for 65 euro. FCO, 18 inch lawnmower, now 449 euro, save 100. All this and more, see homeland.ie. Here at Tesco Mobile, we've gone and opened a new phone shop in Letterkenny High. A great wee spot now for a few good deals, like saving €320 when you buy the iPhone 13 for €129.99 on our €35 plan high. So why not stop in and say hi, uh, hello, to Tesco Mobile High. This is Supermarket Mobile. Applies to new bill pay customers on our €35 per month plan. 24-month contract offer ends 1st of May 2024. T's and C's apply. See tescomobile.ie. Looking for your perfect exclusive wedding venue? The Red Door Country House is nestled on a four-acre site on the shores of Los Willy, located in Fawn Bunkrana. We are offering a reduced package price for remaining dates this year. Contact info at thereddoor.ie for all your wedding inquiries. Gareth here from TFS and Letterkenny. We are now taking bookings for the busy spring-summer period. If you are a business or homeowner anywhere in the northwest, let us take care of your painting, power washing and landscaping. Also, facility management, cleaning and utility needs. Call us today on 917760 or email accounts at tfsireland.ie. Refresh your shoe wardrobe with the latest arrivals from Green Shoes, bringing you the latest styles from top brands such as Riker, Birkenstock and Wonders. Also, New Balance, Bugatti, XTA and many more. Step into style this season with Green Shoes, Market Square, Letterkenny Shopping Centre and Volcara or at greenshoes.com. One for all and shop LK cards accepted. Go all Aldi for even longer. Enjoy even more Aldi quality and value with our extended opening hours. Spend more time filling up your trolley with award winners, offers you can't refuse and savings on your cravings. 8am till 10pm Monday to Saturday and 9am to 9pm on Sundays and bank holidays. That's more time to spend less money on the things you love. Follow the path to lower prices. Go all Aldi. Location variations apply. Visit stores.aldi.ie for details. OK, it is uh, Thursday the 4th of April, 7 minutes past 11, and we're talking history now with historian and author Dr Joe Kelly, and we're going to tease out the idea of a republic because we know every Easter we commemorate 1916 with the president at the GPO, the army in attendance, and the reading of the 1916 uh, proclamation of the Irish Republic. We are a republic. But what is the historical background to this system of government going back a 1,000 years? Professor Kelly, good morning to you. My team, my good uh, Greg, and good luck to you, and to your listeners there in Highland Radio. Good morning to you. There are a number of republics around the Republic of Congo and all this kind of stuff, right? So, what is a republic? What 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 distinguishes it from uh, countries that don't declare themselves a republic? Yeah, well, from the outset, maybe often people here in our own country think of republicanism always in a, a militarily in, in that sense. Um, of an armed struggle for national independence um, and the, the pursuit of that uh, and the idea nearly that not enough people have been killed yet in the name of the Irish Republic. And that's not what we're on about. And we have to stand back from that. You know, that's a corruption and a debasement of our understanding of what actually a republic is. So I think need, we need to appeal to people's better reason and understanding when we're talking about republic. That's not what we're talking about, this kind of military glorification of an armed struggle. Absolutely not. But the idea of a republic, in essence, means that the people... Uh, control the power. They are the power. They are the base. They are sovereign. And that they elect people then to represent them and to act on their behalf in the in the creation of a government. Uh, and that's fundamentally what, you know, a, um, a republic is. In other words, that the government works for the people. Is that not that what th every democratic country is, though? Not necessarily, because there are different types of uh, republics, for just just for example, in England, you have a democratically elected government, but then the king and the monarchy have a say in all of that. You have the House of Lords. It's a different. But that's more... a lot of that ceremonial, though, isn't it, uh, Joe? Fundamentally, the same, aren't they? 
I mean, not necessarily because the House of Lords do, does have power mm. to block and to change uh, laws within England. Um, and they are and appointed, the, aren't they? The, the House yes, of Lords. Yes, right. as where with us, like in our Erectus, for example, there's three parts. There's the lower house, which is the dial. You have the upper house, which is the Senate, Shannon, and then finally, then you have the president. And for a law to become law, all these, all those three parts of the stool, so to speak, the three legs of the stool, have to say, like the president has to sign it into law, otherwise it doesn't become law. And our president is elected democratically. So in that sense, that, that's what's understood as, as a republic. But look, there's different versions. But different before we get into that, though, so, so yeah. some members of the Senate are appointed, though, and they aren't elected by the majority of the people. You know, they're elected by small groups of people and as I say, some are appointed. That doesn't, in any way, does it complicate or encroach on, on a republic or republicanism? Well, in our constitution, the idea behind it in our constitution was that it would be, a republic would be representative. So, for example, the Tisha gets to appoint, I think, six, um, sorry, ten, there's ten that are appointed. Uh, the universities get to appoint four and four, the National University and the uh, Trinity College. So the idea that there's a spectrum of people, and, and usually you. it isn't necessarily for any particular purpose. For example, you know, people are appointed because of maybe the, um, their um, a verge representation of, of people or a group or a community, you know, um, um, so in that sense, there's a, a wonderful openness, but the majority of the Senate is elected by the county councillors. Mm. County councillors have two constitutional powers. One is that they can elect the upper house very much so. So each councillor has five votes for five panels. And the second thing then is the county councils, each county council can nominate a candidate for president. So I mean, that's an unbelievable constitutional privilege that our county councillors mm. have that other democracies don't have. So it brings it right back to the, the as much as you can to ground level so as i said republics are understood differently in different countries and there's different elements to it um and so look but at, our, is our like well, well, uh, we can answer the question through the question i suppose to some extent so you know the concept of a republic um is, is quite normal now right but how far back do we have to go before the either the first republic was established or the term uh, republic was used to sort of describe a, a, an establishment. I imagine it might have seemed like a really, uh, like a reinventing the wheel at a certain time. Um, not necessarily. If we go back maybe to the, about the 5th century BC, so that's really when we first be, we see a, a, a republic, that, and the raised public it comes from the Latin, meaning public affairs. How, how is the society run? How is public affairs run? And the idea in Roman times was that uh, representatives were there to represent the well-being of everybody, the common good. Um and, and that's initially where it started. Now, it was very limited because the Romans understood as we, we elect somebody that will champion us and maybe be good to us. And um, oftentimes the republics fell into tyranny. And that has been the history of republics. Republics also fail. And I, I think that's maybe, we'll talk maybe in, further on about that, but republics fail and when they do, the consequences aren't good. So the first evidence of, of that was within Rome. But then Ath Athens was another place um, in, in Greece. Um, the whole idea of a republic was very much developed there with philosophers like Plato. He wrote a book called uh, the, the Republic. But yeah. what was it replacing, though, Joe? That's the, the point I'm trying to, you know, what was what 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 does what was a, back, back? I suppose when re republics were first being established, what were they replacing, and was it seen at that time to be a a, a, a significantly different way of doing things, or, or was it just? Well, monarchy and absolutism and might is right, that whole idea was there in, in that time. The, the word bonus in Latin um, means good, and, and an etymologist have believed that it comes from the word donus, which means a soldier. And so to do good was to subdue people. And that was the Roman ideology and the Roman Empire, that if you subdue people, that was good. Mm. Uh, so it developed away from that towards an idea that, look, it's the common good, it's not the individual good, and we must think of the well-being of everybody. Um, so that that's was what it was replacing, and it was further developed by the Greeks. They they were very advanced in it, and so far as Plato, a great philosopher, and I would say his book, The Republic, it's a book called The Republic, um, has probably been one of the most influ influential books on the concept of republic uh, theory and political theory and over the centuries. Uh, and his understanding was that you know. Uh, 
Protection, wisdom, and courage, and justice, and temperance should be in control of society, um, looking after the common good of the city. Uh, and what he talked about was that the, the the politicians that they would elect each person, they would have gold in their veins rather than maybe some of our politicians having our gold in their pockets. But the idea of you know being honourable and upright uh, and always willing to serve, so that has uh, had a massive influence. The Greek understanding of a republic then for centuries and centuries um, influenced the whole concept of a republic, so much so that we, we can jump into, the, say, the time of the French Revolution, where the idea of monarchy was no longer valid. They didn't want any more monarchy, monarchy absolute rights and divine rights of kings. Timeline, and, that, timeline that for us, the French Revolution. Oh, seven, uh, 1789 was the French Revolution, um, and they were just tired of, of monarchy and the absolute absolutism of monarchy. Uh, um, and so they revolted and, and they wanted liberty, equality, fraternity, liberty, equality and fraternity, that whole ideology. Um, and that was like a domino, that idea of a republic in France, their tricolour, the, the the blue, the white and the and the red. Uh, and it's influenced Wolf Tone. Um, Wolf Tone is the father of Irish republicanism. And we have the 1798 rebellion, United Irish Men. And once again, uh, his ideology was that we must um, take our Catholic brethren from their knees. He said, I tried to raise, you know, three, three million of my um, brethren to, to, um, to the status of citizen, that he believed totally in equality. And Patrick Pierce claimed that Wolf Tone was the greatest Irishman that ever lived. Uh, a Protestant who who championed the whole idea of a republic, and many people today would see our ideology of a republic going back to that time of the United Irishmen. So that kind so, of so so we we've, we've sort of timelined uh, republics, and it goes back really quite some time. But is there sort of like a, a, a more contemporary time, a more modern time, whereby you know we start seeing you know republics established? broadly as governments in in the way that we understand them now yeah really it's it's something that is relatively new in, in essence you're talking about maybe 100 150 years ago some of the dates the portuguese republic 1910 china actually is a republic 1912 india and they really celebrate the idea of their republic every year 1947 uh, and surprisingly enough People maybe think that we became a republic with 1916 or with the 1937 constitution. We didn't become a republic of Ireland until 1949. So we're kind of a, a latecomers to the, the concept. Or Do to we the... celebrate it? You talked of the Indian uh, it, it being celebrated in India, but I mean, we don't as such, do we? Or do we? You know, as a, as a, as a, broadly as a nation. No, I don't think we do. And, and that maybe goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning, that there's this idea that there's a militarialism with, and, and you know, excuse the, the phrase, but up the idea of republicanism, when, when in fact that's a very narrow understanding of republicanism. And many republicans call themselves republicans, and all as they are are geographical republicans. They just want to unite Ireland and... That's it. And your show or your tall your previous contributor was talking about you know United Ireland and how that would form. It's a lot more than just being a geography uh, and drawing lines on a map. Well, it's uh, actually we going to be way much more than that once we once we get down to the nitty gritty of the conversation. That's why there's a bit of resistance to a document like that being published because it seems to be a an anti unification or reunification, sorry, uh, project. It may or may not be seen as such, but the reality is is people don't want to be faced with potentially the reality of the conversation we're actually going to have and therefore go well that must be bad because it, it, it's too you know that's not we don't, don't want to hear that i don't i don't think that's healthy we have to talk about everything uh, well if you look at john a coslo that, that declared ireland a republic in 1946 um it, it um it was only 96 words uh, five sentences um and it, it was the act of 1948 sorry and it became law in 1949 and really, it achieved nothing. It, it was a republic. We became a republic by name, but not by principle, not by essence. Uh, and so if we're talking about a United Ireland and a re the ideology of republic... Right, well, well then talk to me then. What is generally accepted to be the characteristics of a republic? And then, obviously, and this is a bit of history, but also a bit of opinion, what distinguishes us from what would be seen as the main characteristics of a republic? 
Well, first and foremost, there maybe are, are, are three things that in any republic that you should have. First is the fairness, that representation of those elected to make fair laws. That's the first thing, that there's fairness. And that the common welfare is achieved. That would be the second thing, that that it's not about a vested interest or one group of people where, where the common welfare of everybody is considered. So you're talking about United Ireland? The common welfare includes the unionist people, the Protestant traditions, all that. But does that uh, extend to to sort of power and wealth, though? Because at the end of the day, you know, power is held by a relatively small group of of, of individuals. You can see with the frustration uh, across society that, that that's being seen. Now, wealth, uh, a very small uh, number of people um, control the wealth or have the wealth. Is that anti-republicanism or anti-republic, <laughs> sorry? To some degree it is, and I mean, there's different types of republicanism. There might be socialist republicanism, there might be free economic republicanism, but one of the other characteristics of, of republicanism and freedom and prosperity, that people are given the chance to prosper. Um, and if there are driven agendas, if there are people at the top controlling everything, then that denies people freedom and it denies them the possibility of having prosperity. So, see, the idea of a nation, we're, we're a nation of Ireland, and... Um, and Ireland isn't just the geographical landmass. We have a nation that's worldwide, uh, Irish Americans all over the world. But a republic is something totally different, and people confuse that. A republic is a nation doesn't necessarily die that easily. It, it goes on. We've stood, you know, we've had immigration, famine, colonialism, and the nation of Ireland is still here. But a republic is a totally different thing. A republic is something that people have to strive to achieve and have to work at and have to maintain and have to get a balance. Yeah, we have and to have so a sense of ownership, though, and a sense of control. Yeah, and art if, you, if, you, if, that, if that's taken from people, then you control the people. Yes, and, and, and Article 9.3 of our Constitution states that it's the... Um, Fidelity to the nation and loyalty to the state is the fundamental duty of every citizen, that there's a civic responsibility on every person to keep our republic and to fight for it. And so, I mean, the, the whole idea you're asking about, you know, our republic and what are the characteristics of it, a lot of that is to already be found, for example, in the 1916 proclamation that people hold very dear or in our constitution. Uh, and if we go into our Article 6, it talks about the idea that power comes from the people, that we, the people, own our republic. That's every man, woman and child on this nation, on this country, owns a republic. And and the proclamation talks about Ireland being sovereign, that we have the ownership of Ireland and that we are the unfettered control of Irish destinies to be sovereign and indefeasible. In other words, that we control our own country and that we are responsible yeah, for... But we do that, that through elections and and, and 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 the subsequent government that's appointed from that, though. Is that not... Could you not sort of... Uh, whether we like it or not, at the end of the day, it is people that vote people into power that creates a government. Uh, that is control of the republic. Oh, and this is where the the, the the concern is. And I said earlier on that many republics end up in tyrannies. They, they collapse and go into tyrannies. And I, I would have been saying that our republic was heading the wrong way up until the last referendum. Uh, and I think in the last referendum, for whatever reason, and I don't want to get into the reasoning of it, but people took back control and said, no, this is our constitution. We control mm. it. And all our parties, all our, all five Donegal TDs, all our parties told us, bar one, I think, Ian, to, told us to vote yes. And people said, no, we're not voting yes. This is We're voting no, and this is our constitution. And in a way, we've wrestled back some bit of the power of our constitution from the politicians. But I would argue that really we, we only had a republic for at most 26 years until we joined the EU. And since we've joined the EU, we have been overrun um, our sovereignty and our own self-destiny has been controlled and possibly but that's bullied. by choice. Well, I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I see a republic by definition. Like we have joined, we have joined a union, okay, where there are share interests and shared decision making. But within that too, we do have, like I think to some extent, you might be given a government to pass because we do have opt outs. We do have autonomy. We can, we can, we do have, um, you know, we can invoke. Um, it's, it's opt out but a derogation and you know what i mean like I, I get what you're saying but 
I don't think we exercise. I don't think we exercise much of the power that we actually have. Uh, what, I say we, right? I'm talking about the government here. So I, I wouldn't say is it necessarily not as how we've what we've done uh, in joining the EU. It's how we sort of uh, bend our knee to the EU when often we don't actually have to. And that's, I agree with you, we have authority, again, the people are sovereign. Um, and it says that in our constitution, and it says that in our 1916 proclamation. And that's why I say that our republic could possibly be heading towards a form of tyranny, because most of our laws are being imposed not by our government, by the EU. The EU are fining Ireland daily, millions of pounds, because we're not implementing their laws quick enough in our country. But we help to write those laws also. Yeah, absolutely. And so the question is, have we as a nation of people consented to these laws? We haven't. And so therefore, the thing is, our politicians have been to some degree negligent and have wrestled more and more and more power away from the people from the, the root of the whole idea of republic, that the people are sovereign. And, and again, it's a question of how are we going to won that back Um and 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 that's that's the question that people need to to to, uh, to ask. You see, I think the last referendum, people moved and they realised that they were being chained. They realised they were being lied to. They realised that things weren't as healthy as we might like to think mm. it was. And their eyes now are open. But, but the thing no is, Joe, the thing is, though, no man is an island, OK? Um, and, and, you know, we can sort of talk about, you know, a republic and stuff in a historical context, right? The British themselves thought that they could wrestle back their sovereignty from from the EU but they also then had to learn that you have to do deals with the EU that you have to deal do deals with uh, America that you have to try and do deals with uh, Brazil and India and Canada and the reality is is that there's there's a there's a there's a global system right that really su kind of to some extent supersedes the union that you can't just quit it and then have absolute sovereignty, close your borders and do deals with however you want because we're not in the 18th century anymore and we're not selling flour and, and sugar. You know what I mean? It's a, the world is a, a very different place that some of these ideologies probably no longer function or exist in. They're hitting the nail on the head. So therefore, that's my point. Is our republic in danger? Are we moving out of the idea of Ireland being a republic? Are we giving away our powers as a nation, a sovereign and defensible people to other EU diktats, the UN, the WHO? Are we being consulted as a people and are we consenting to this? And at the end of the day, I'm a Republican and I believe that the authority must rest with the people. But what happens is, is then we're coming up to an election, you get people that articulate in a meaningful way uh, and, and, a, and a way that, that, that makes sense. They articulate what they would do as the leaders of this great republic uh, within, you know, in engaging with the UN, in engaging with the EU, in engaging with the, the, the WHO. Because there's great, whilst you talk of disadvantages, there are great advantages with that as well. And, and, and I, don't think we, I don't think we can sort of discount that. But no the whole idea of democracy, is it not that that then, you know, okay. people will, um, you know, you, you vote and that's how you decide it all. Uh, see, my idea would be that we share our sovereignty, but that we don't give it away. Uh, and there's a difference there. It's like, you know, the United States of Europe or the state of Europe. And what we're moving to is a world state where we're being forced as a country. I'm quite willing to, you know, share sovereignty, but it's our sovereignty. And do you see, the, the thing is, we're beginning to lose grip of our republic. And I think that's a very, very precarious position. And up until the last referendum, I think people have woken up. They're standing in the light. And there's no point in us having our eyes closed anymore. We need to realise we are in a precarious, dangerous mm. position with regards to our public. More and more laws... But how do, we, how do we retain our, 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 our full control, sovereignty and our status as a republic in this new world? I think, first of all, that we have politicians that will respect and understand what a republic is. I mean, again, go back to the understanding of Chak the Dala, a messenger to the dial. We send them to the dial with a message. What we have at the moment is DTs, Dala chapter. They're coming from the dial with a message to us, telling us what to do. This is not what a republic mm. okay. does. So we could I argue the toss as to whether or not this is a, a functioning republic, a republic at all, at all. 
is there a mechanism is there a mechanism or something that would happen rather than us interpreting whether or not we're a republic or not that we actually no longer become a republic you know i mean is there an official forum forum or or pathway to actually changing that status not that there's any appetite to it but you are of the belief right that tyranny could replace the republic but that's a feeling or a sense or an interpretation is there anything formally that could happen that you would renounce uh, your your status as a republic well, we could go back into the British Empire. Okay, or we well, could, we any could other options? A, we could become a monarchy. <laughs> Is there any other we could options? become an oligarchy. Okay. Um, you know, we, I, I think that all the ills that Republican has, the idea of being a Republic has, and it does have its ills, there's no doubt about that. But wait till you go and try something else, you'd come back and want to be a Republic. In our constitution and in our ideology, people are sovereign. And as, as, a, as an individual, I would be very, very concerned that we've lost our sovereignty uh, very much so. And I'm reminded of Michael Collins when he was in the treaty negotiations with the British Empire over in, in London um, in, the, in 1921. He says, one beautiful line, it's in the film, give us back, give us the future. We've had enough of your past. Give us back our country to live and to grow and to love. And, and if the dial politicians are listening, we want our country back to love and to grow and to live in. Yeah. And we don't need to be dictated to all the time. And let's listen to the people. And if we go back to Plato and his Republic... But the people, talk- but if you, you'll notice that the, the, the politicians are starting to listen. It's as we approach an election, but um, uh, there, there, there's a, an awful lot of change in policies here, there and everywhere. One more question, Joe. Sorry to cut you off yes. in your prime. The tricolour then, it, it, it is perceived as uh, the symbol of the Republic and obviously the controversies that can go with that as well. Is it the tricolour? Does it symbolise our Republic? Well, that's what it was initially meant to be. I talked about the red, white and blue of the French tricolour and we got the same idea, Maher, that started off the green, white and the orange for the green for the Catholics and the nationalist orange for the Protestant Unionist tradition and white for the peace. And we need to claim back our tricolour. I genuinely believe that. And it's not a military thing that was draping the coffins of men that murdered people. Absolutely, that is not what our tricolour represents. Our tricolour represents the sovereignty of the people, the individual people of this country, and all that is good about this country. And you know what I would encourage people to do? To claim back the tricolour, put it up outside your house. And it's not a Sinn Féinism, it's not a republicanism in the sense of militarism. It's about our constitution we are the sovereign people. And if we put up our tricolours out our, outside our houses and bought one and put it up, and let the politicians come and canvas, and when they come to our house, they know what we're saying. Just in relation to that, and I don't want to be controversial, country. but I mean, you know, is it up to anyone to really dictate what the flag means? You know, you could have someone who could, you could have someone, and not in my name, you could say, but you could have someone that, that, that carries out a horrendous act, but in the belief, and this is in no way to justify it, but in the belief it was to fight for the Republic. Do people have the right to say, oh, no, 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 this is what this flag means and this is what a republic is? Well, what the flag in essence means, it's the union of two cultures with peace in the middle. That's in essence what it is, and it's the symbol of our republic. Now, people may misuse that and try to claim it this way or that way, uh, and I think that's unfortunate because it has damaged our understanding of our tricolour. And whatever chances we have of United Ireland... I certainly do not want our tricolour to be seen as something of triumphalism, mm-hmm. of militarianism, and of us beating you or, you know, uh, being, being more superior military. Just... Enough people have died, so to speak, in the name of this Irish Republic, and it's time to give peace a chance, and it's time to be honest and clear about what our Republic is and what our tricolour is. And as I say, I'm proud to fly my tricolour, and I think it's something that we should be encouraging our young men and women, boys and girls, to fly okay. our tricolour. Do you know the feeling we get in St. Patrick's Day and on Easter Sunday of being proud of being Irish? That's what I understand when I fly my tricolour. And people in my country have different views to me absolutely but we're all one and we're all struggling and trying to make this country a better place that's what our tricolour is about that's what our constitution is about and that's what our republic's about dr joe kelly historian and author thank you so much for joining us to uh, talk history have a lovely day have you entered our ten thousand euro home makeover jaw if the answer is yes 
you are now automatically entered into our extra cash giveaway. If the answer is no, then now is the time to enter. Greg Hughes will be ringing one lucky person on Friday the 5th of April, giving you the chance to win €2,500 in cash. That's not all. You will still have a chance of winning in our main draw of a €10,000 home makeover in association with Foy & Company, plus €5,000 in cash. Get your ticket now at HighlandRadio.com. Testing, testing. Do you need to get your hearing tested? Test your hearing with a free sample hearing aid from Hidden Hearing. Order your free sample hearing aid today. Call 1-800-370-0000 or visit hiddenhearing.ie. Make more meals for less with Dunn Stores, where you'll save in the aisle with ingredients for a delicious sausage pasta bake. That's eight pork sausages, just one euro. Baked in a delicious bolognese sauce with peppers, red onions and fusilli pasta. Just 70 cent for 500 grams. Topped with 65 cent mozzarella cheese. All from the Dunn Stores range. Plus, you can save at the till with a 5 off 25 grocery voucher. Dunn Stores. Always better value. Terms and conditions apply. Voucher abuse to next in-store grocery shop of 25 euro or more. Looking for that Brooks experience? Try the new range at bmcsports.ie. New Ghost Max, Glycerin 21, or the Adrenaline GTS 23. Step into our safe size experience so we can fit the best trainer for your foot. Let us make your trainer experience the best it can be. Brian McCormick Sports, Main Street, Letterkenny. Aurora's Hobbits, Crossroads, Killy Gordons seek employees to join their expanding creche. Both full-time and part-time roles from 15 to 40 hours per week depending on the role. Must hold a QQI level 5 or equivalent. Please apply by email to aurorashobbits at gmail.com. The moment you win the semis becomes the journey on the way to the final. Hands clutching hurls and a bus full of messes, making bonds that will last a lifetime. Practicing for your Irish oral on the way. What did you do this weekend? Last weekend? Every weekend? And the whole team laughing because the answer is always the same. Camogie. It's the minor moments that last a lifetime. The Electric Ireland Camogie Minor Championships. This is major. Now, you're very welcome back to the programme. We're joined uh, on the programme now by two guests. Dr. Moura Birmingham, good morning to you. Thank you very much for your time today. Morning, Craig. And also Dr. Sarah Brennan. Good morning, Sarah. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi, Greg. Thank you. It's good to have you with us. Now, both uh, of our guests are G GPs and they're part of a group of medics who are against euthanasia and assisted suicide. A meeting is uh, taking place. It's a public meeting in the Glencar Conference Room Mount Ergel Hotel on Tuesday, the 9th of April at 7.30pm. There's a whole host of guest speakers, including uh, Professor Ken Mulpeter, consultant geriatrician who's been on this programme before, uh, Dr Avril Fanton, palliative care consultant, Ms Magella Sweeney, Director of Nursing, and it's chaired by Dr Mura Birmingham, who is a GP. And, you know, looking down uh, that list of guest speakers, uh, Dr Mura, and, uh, you know, a lot of them are involved in, in the care of people uh, as they get older, as they edge towards the end of uh, life. Uh, and, and, and interesting to get their perspectives as the caregivers at that time in our lives. Yeah, yeah that's very true. And it's great that we can, um, you know, when patients or people approach the, their end of their lives, that, um, that, that these services are provided by, um, you know, by a geriatrician, with illnesses to to ensure that people have hope and can trust a medical profession that they'll be um, treated and will recover. And then when we go to the palliative care, um, we, we would see they would speak about how palliative care itself helps people with um, serious problems, particularly with pain uh, and management of other um, chronic conditions. Um, and also the office facilities to help them to be more at ease and give them hope and make them more relaxed with their terminal illness to, uh, when they're coming towards the end of their life. Um, so, and also they look after, you know, when, when they die, looking after relatives and uh, giving them advice on how to cope. And, and then we move over to the, uh, <clears throat> to the nursing home aspect of how people who uh, have come to the end of their lives and that um, their families can't put them on anymore uh, and due to their their, their illnesses um, and they just need extra care. And um, in the nursing home aspect, 
you, you will see that every person that comes into a nursing home is treated with dignity. And no matter what their physical state that they're present, presented in, it, it's recognised that their dignity is uh, invaluable and um, treated um, as a human person. Uh, and this is very important because when you start to talk about assisted dying and euthanasia, this, it seems that this becomes all blocked out. This whole range of facilities and people who, uh, you know, have offered their services to help uh, people um, cope with um, end of care or with a terminal illness. Dr. Sarah, I'm... I haven't fully made my mind up on this, really, to be honest with you. And, and, and it's I, I often sort of try and learn by speaking to people, uh, you know, because there are stories whereby a very compelling argument is made for assisted uh, dying or assisted suicide. And then, you know, we hear counter arguments. But the, the thing is, is that, that I still haven't got my head around is why are we discussing this? What has driven this conversation? I've not randomly spoken to anyone whereby anyone has said, do you know what we need in this country? We need assisted dying. Like what's driving, or, or have you figured out what's driving this conversation? I suppose it's, it's what's happening internationally. We see that it's happened in some states in, in the US, in Canada, in the Netherlands, in Belgium. Um, so there has been this drive towards um, people, individuals having the right to die themselves within their own terms. Um, and that's what's probably pushing it, is this individual's appreciation of their own autonomy, which is really, really important. And I do I do value that every day in our work as doctors. That is a really important part that we consider in the ethics of delivering care, which is what this comes back to. And I suppose from our point of view, we have a worry that this individual um, expression of autonomy can risk others um, and they would be the people who are most vulnerable and they would be the people that Professor Kenmel Peter takes care of, that Dr. Alva Fontaine takes care of and that Magella Sweeney um, holds and takes care of in, in her nursing home. They would be the most vulnerable people and there may become this, this duty to die then as well. That, that people you may you're feel a burden. Pardon, that you're a burden, yeah. exactly, because we see it every day when we do a house call and it, and it is a privilege to go into someone's home. But we see how the family are all rallying around that person, helping and taking care of them. And it could be very easy for a person to see that as being a burden on their family, although that person usually has taken care of those people when they've been babies. And they've been so dependent on on parental and and others' um, help and love and care and attention. But so sorry, to some extent, say worry. for instance, if you had uh, one of your patients, okay, and, and and they might fare quite well from treatment for cancer or something, and I'm not sure if it has happened or does happen, but they say. I don't want to go through that. Or this might say, if it's a, if it's a, 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 a cancer, they've, they've had cancer before, I'm not going through that again. And to some extent, is that not an acceptable, albeit hard to swallow sometimes, choice that's already being made, that people are already, to some extent, potentially determining their lifespan? And, and absolutely, that is a really important choice for people to make. And, and we would discuss the benefits of treatment over no treatment um, and help people understand what the risks are and what the benefits are of doing either of those things so that people then can make informed choice. And that's really important. That's what we do every day when we're discussing care with patients is we make shared management plans. We don't decide it's not a paternalistic type of medicine delivery anymore. It's shared decision making. And that is really important that people know what is in store for them so they can make choices that are informed. Another problem that we have, uh, Dr. Birmingham, in that we're not really, we can't necessarily even discuss what the introduction of assisted uh, suicide, assisted dying would actually mean because there's a distrust amongst the electorate that, you know, even if a question were put to them and they in good conscience voted one way or another, that what followed could be something very, very different, that the boundaries could be widened, that we could become a, you know, a, a tourism hotspot for this type of stuff, that the checks and balances that were promised might not be enforced or could be relaxed. Could you understand, uh, Dr. Birmingham, how someone might feel that? 
Uh, yeah, I, I do. Um, you see, um, when um, you introduce um, euthanasia and assisted suicide, um, it, even if it gets onto the statute book and you have such a very, uh, it's tightly bound with um, <clears throat> provisions of what, uh, what cases should be uh, should be, have be euthanized or been assisted in suicide, um, and the safeguards put in, um, that becomes very controversial because you have in law then that the person can be assisted uh, in dying and uh, provided uh, euthanasia um, or uh, physician assisted suicide, where the actually the patient is killed, you know, through either medicines. Um, types of medicines that are administered either by the nurse practitioner or the doctor. So, um, and it, it takes, as I was saying before, it takes away the whole aspect of terminal care because it becomes more instant uh, the way death is approached. Um, and <clears throat> I would say that uh, once that it becomes law, the safeguards can be challenged. And, uh, it, and it's very hard to maintain these uh, safeguards, and um, <clears throat> so it, it the the whole uh, definition of uh, assisted suicide progressively starts to widen and starts embracing. It starts off with uh, chronic illness, and then it spreads to the terminal ill, and then we have a situation where it starts to to involve children. And we know in Holland that uh, a couple of years ago. They, it was, they expanded it to children aged between 10 and 1. So, um, and also there's a really major problem going on uh, in Holland where um, it becomes involuntary, where if a doctor decides that the person can't make uh, the decision um, about uh, suicide, that they can um, act uh, in their place, uh, so it becomes uh, involuntary suicide. Uh, and this is the big fear that um, Professor uh, Meyer, um, a, um, a a bioethicist from Holland, said that um, it becomes so unmanageable that the, the whole program of euthanasia and the way it's administered that um, people are starting to be euthanized. Um, uh, you know, uh, against the will, uh, it they do not are, are unable to give consent, mm. and um, he said it's become a disaster the way it's uh, it's been managed. Like I can think of, as to say, I, I'm not taking a position on this. I, I'm just working through it myself. But I can think of of a situation, you know, whereby you have an older person who does not necessarily have, you know, family around them. Um, discharged from an acute hospital, maybe in a you know a, a nursing home or what have you, uh, seeing this as 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 an option, that's not what people would be voting for, I don't think, because they see themselves as a burden. Or and it's quite interesting, I think, in that you know some people prefer to use the word assisted suicide, and others, perhaps more in favour of it, prefer to use the words assisted dying because it sounds. It sounds more sort of nice uh, in in a way, which is is kind of interesting in terms of language, Doctor Brennan. Too, when we discuss this, and we've seen it with with previous referendums uh, on on healthcare and what have you, you know, we we are going to hear the story, Sarah, of you know people in in great deal of pain, clearly uh, about to die, uh, and and it, it you know it pulls the heart from your chest, and you could say, well, how could anyone deny them the right? To, to, to end their life. But then I'd be familiar with cases in, in Belgium where a person in in their mid-30s had a, quite a recent diagnosis of MS and, you know, you probably would struggle to even note that they had MS, but can kill or can have assisted dying, assisted suicide. You know, that's not probably the kind of case we're going to see when we start debating this properly, if that makes sense. Yeah, and, and this is how it works when it's introduced. It's introduced usually with a very strict set of criterion where it can only be, it can only take place within certain situations. Um, and then as people feel that they have a right to access this as well, then it expands. And that's a natural occurrence that will always occur due to 
rights issues, actually. Um, and it's interesting you talk about that case of pain because um, Dr. Fergal Toomey, who's a palliative care consultant, he gave evidence at the Joint Committee. Um, and, and really, with, with palliative care services as they are and as they will um, be more funded, so this is something that needs to happen, they need to be more funded, people should not suffer pain like that. We have all of the medical capacities to treat people's pain. They should not suffer like that. Um, anybody who has um, passed away or many families who've passed, who, who, where their, their family, their loved ones have passed away at home, they've been in a position to get care from palliative care nurses and for all of this pain to be um, treated appropriately. So, so that we can, we can cater for that amount of pain that people may have at the end of life. But, but helping people hold the emotional and psychological distress of dying is something that can happen from palliative care perspective mm -hmm. as well. And GPs do this all the time by helping people, supporting them in their support of their loved ones and their families. So that we have a lot of um, services in place, but services that need to be more funded before we start putting money into euthanasia. And I think that's something that the Joint Committee re recommended in their report. Um, but I think if we bring in euthanasia, then those services will not be um, funded properly. So really, we, we need to fund those end of life services better so that we can provide better care, we can give hope, and we can show people who are in this vulnerable group, that actually their lives matter yeah. to us and to everybody. My great concern is the way society is being set up to neglect older people, uh, to, to, to make them feel like the world is moving on, that they're left behind, that they are a burden, that it's a problem to try and get a bus to them. It's a problem to try and get them into an ED. It's a problem to try and allow them to spend cash. And then you layer this on top of it. You just do wonder, uh, would it be a, no country for old men and women, uh, so to speak? Again, that's only a concern. I haven't made up my mind at all uh, on this. Um, and, and very finally, Dr. Moran, I wish our line was better to you. I can hear what you're saying. It's just not quite as clear as I'd like for our listeners. And it's not your fault. It just is a, it's just a happenstance of technology. Your, your comments that, that I'm hearing from you, and, and if I'm hearing them correctly, quite similar to those of Professor Ken Mulpeter, in that it, is it that it potentially changes our attitude to care? Or, or you know, I don't want to paraphrase incorrectly, but it's the it's the wider ramifications for actual the care of people. No, I I, th I see the um, this whole assisted suicide has a, a destructive effect on the patient doctor relationship, and um, <clears throat> also when p patients come in to see the doctor, the, the, the main thing is to want to be put at ease, but also have hope, and this will take away hope <clears throat> from the from the whole care process. And um, I think, um, you know, it, it, it will have a serious effect. And um, the other thing I would like to say is that you were asking about the driving force earlier on, but you must remember that it's sort of been put on people to think about it because, um, because of Gino Kelly's bill that was um, passed two stages where the majority of the TUDs voted on it and a lot of their constituencies weren't aware that the, you know, assisted suicide or was coming in. Uh, and it was only when the medical profession objected to it that they decided to uh, examine the whole thing and uh, create a committee. And um, the problem I would say about the committee is that a lot of the um, members of the committee had already voted twice for assisted suicide. Now, uh, so, what, what is happening now is maybe uh, in this life of the Doyle that uh, the bill will come to fruition and the TDs will vote on it a third time. And if it's a majority vote for it, it means that um, assisted suicide will uh, become a way of life. And in fact, they will come into the management of all aspects of healthcare, you know, in the hospitals, in general practice. And this is one of the big things that I find very hard to understand is if, is a, if a person comes in and uh, feeling suicidal and uh, what do you say to a person when you have to inform them that you have a right to kind of be assisted in the dying, your own dying? Um, and I, I find that really hard to take on board.
OK, listen, um, both of you, thank you very much. I'm going to remind the listeners of, of the date and time of, of the public meeting. But for now, uh, Dr. Murra Birmingham, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And you as well, Dr. Sarah Brennan. Have a lovely day. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take Bye. care. Uh, so they are amongst a group of medics who are against euthanasia and assisted suicide stroke dying. It's a public meeting that's taking place in the Glencar Conference Room in the Mount Ergal Hotel Letter. Can it's next Tuesday, the 9th of April at 7.30pm. And this meeting is... is a by medics opposed to it. Uh, guest speakers, Professor Kenmore Peter, Dr Avril Fontaine, uh, Ms Margella, Margella Sweeney, uh, Dr Mura Birmingham, who we heard from there, is uh, the uh, who is the uh, chair. Uh, they are in favour... The, there's a joint directors committee on assisted dying um, and a report was published, a majority report was published, which kind of paves the way for it. There was a minority report, I think, from one of the Healy Rays. Uh, they are more in favour of that. OK, we'll take a break. Back with the weather. Stay where you are. With Big Scoop Ice Cream at Kelly Steiner in Letterkenny, there's so much choice. From Bubblegum Blast to Oreo Crunch, named after Kelly's famous robot waiter, there's loads of flavours to choose from, or you can create your own. Treat the kids and the big kids to a yummy ice cream dessert at Kelly's Diner, Mountaintop, Letterkenny. Waterworld Bundoran is back for the 2024 season and is open every day over the Easter holidays until April 7th. Experience the three-lane multi-slide, the Wizard, the Wave Pool and Rapids, the Twister Tornado and Gravity Speed Slides, the Pirates Galleon Ship and more. Booking essential. Get your tickets now at waterworldbundoran.com slash booking and find us on Facebook. Sheena Noel Design, formerly the Fabric Centre, Letterkenny is now open in Boncrana with a beautiful new studio ready to welcome you. With a vast fabric and wallpaper library, we deliver beautiful curtains, Roman blinds and upholstery. Motorised blind specialists. We have the inspiration to finish your home. Contact us on 083 3781 871 or check out our social media and website sheenanoeldesign.com for more. Hi, Paddy here at Shane Conley Cars in Donegal Town. Are you looking to upgrade your car? With Shane Conley Cars, you'll find makes and models for every budget. Great finance options and we also accept trade-ins. Check out shaneconleycars.com or call in to us at Shane Conley Cars from Lonnerher Road, Donegal Town. Don't miss the BAFTA award-winning comedian Michael McIntyre's brand new show, Magnificent, at the SSE Arena Belfast on Friday the 31st of May 2024. As always, Highland Radio make it easy for you as we look after all your needs. We will provide luxury transfers, overnight stay at the Clayton Hotel Belfast on a and b basis, your ticket to the show, shopping time in Belfast City Centre. For more information, go to the outlet at highlandradio.com or give us a call on 074 91 25000. Michael McIntyre in Belfast. Are you a male age 40 plus? Are you looking after your health? Letterkenny Medics are now offering a full medical check that includes blood pressure BMI, cardio, respiratory, prostate and testicular checks. Blood tests that will check your sugar levels, cholesterol, lipid and bone profiles with a full aftercare provided including prescriptions or referrals if required. Your health is your wealth. Look an appointment today at letterkennymedics.ie or call 07492 02955. Letterkenny Medics, we listen if you want to talk. When it's time for confirmation or first communion, it's time for a trip to Watson Menswear Letterkenny. Choose from a great selection of top label, casual and formal wear. Suits with matching shirts and ties, blazers and jackets. Also denims, chinos and footwear from big names like Diesel, 1880 Club and Tommy Bow. Stand out on the big day at Watson Menswear. Open seven days a week on Main Street, Debra County and watsonmenswear.com. The CFC Interior Stock Disposal Sale is now on. Due to renovations, an incredible £1.5 million worth of stock must go. Don't miss our highest ever discount on selected ranges across all departments. The Stock Disposal Sale at CFC Interiors Derry, Cookstown and Abbey Centre. Sale now on. Revamp your style at Evolve Clothing Letty Kenny Retail Park and EvolveClothing.com. Easter sale alert. Massive discounts on all stock. 
Go full Lidl with exclusive Lidl Plus Super Savers. Board Bia approved diced Irish chicken fillets were 5 49 now 4 39 Tossing some cherry vine tomatoes, now 51% off at 1 39 And wine of the week, Portuguese Albarino, was 9 99 now 7 69 Scan the Lidl Plus app and go full Lidl today. Get the facts for Drink Aware. Visit drinkaware.ie. Highland Radio weather updates brought to you by McElhenney's. With over 50 years of serving the community in Donegal, McElhenney's is proud to be part of every moment, big and small. Support local, shop McElhenney's Bally Buffet. OK, short in time because I accidentally skipped uh, an ad break. I had to include it there. So largely cloudy this afternoon with a few bright spells. Persistent rain will move in this evening with some heavier outbreaks at times. Highest temperatures of 10 to 12 degrees with moderate south uh, west breezes. That's where we have to leave it on the show. We're back tomorrow with uh, our Friday panel discussing the big stories uh, of the day and week and uh, so much more besides that's entertainment. Uh, but coming up for you a little later on, just after the news, in fact, is John Bredson around the northwest. For me, Greg Hughes and the team,